who had attended it, particularly to hear all the nice things you said about it. And uh, so we will conclude this final morning session with some opening remarks from two of the patrons of the symposium, uh, Professor Hazar, uh, who's the head of the Advanced Studies Institute, and then Jeff Moore, who's our veteran director. So, good morning. Good morning. Actually, uh, my uh, welcoming speech, well, it's strange to call it welcoming when you are on the third day of the symposium, <laughs> but uh, it's going to be in two parts. I was the, the Beckman interim director uh, from 2008 till 2010. I interacted with clouds. Uh, quite a bit, quite frequently during that period, so I'll share with you some memories, some recollections from that period, and, and then the uh, Center for Advanced Study that I'm the director of at this point. So, so I want to take you back to uh, oh, about 18 years, uh, to 2009. Uh, so uh, this is about eight years, seven years, when uh, we were celebrating the, the 20th anniversary of the Institute. And uh, as, as you know, as you all heard, the Institute was uh, uh, founded, opened its door in uh, uh, 1989, and, and Klaus was an original Beckman, that's how it is called, called Anko. He was one of the, the first, his group was one of the first occupants of the, of the institute. So, so we had a, a big event so the, in 2009, and uh, which celebrating the 20th anniversary, and there was a, a symposium. But uh, as you have also heard, that uh, Klaus's group started here around that time, uh, 1989, and it was the 20th anniversary of his group, of TCPG, and, and uh, as an NIH resource, and uh, which was called mac uh, Macromolecular Modeling and Bioinformatics. And, and, and Klaus uh, uh, was very proud of this achievement uh, with the NIH resource continuing for 20 years and, and into the, uh, uh, for many more uh, years and, and decades into the, into the future. And there was a special occasion, a, a special symposium to celebrate that also alongside. So, so these two events were in, in tandem. And uh, uh, I was of course behind the, as, uh, the interim director at the time behind the 20th anniversary of the Institute, uh, organizing that event. But, but also, I uh, was privileged and honored to give the welcoming uh, speech, uh, and that was on day one, actually, it was a one-day symposium, uh, on September 21st, 2009, uh, which was the, the, as I indicated, the CBG's 20th anniversary. It was called Computational Biology of the Cell, uh, the next decade. And so what I want to do is share with you and uh, some of the um, uh, remarks that I made. It was a fairly long speech and, and I have uh, three paragraphs here. Uh, I started off saying that the Beckham Institute and PCBG are connected in many ways including a shared interdisciplinary approach to doing science and the use of technological advancements for enhancing that, that science. And then I talked about, this was, uh, there were actually two speeches. One is the welcoming the, uh, the participants to the symposium, and the other one, there was an advisory board uh, of the NIH resource, and, and it was a talk to that. So this, these are excerpts I've taken from uh, both of these uh, speeches. I talked about uh, Klaus's contributions to the, to the field and, and what difference he made at the Beckman Institute, and, and said Klaus is a visionary who had to wait until technology caught up with what his vision for computing 
could do for the study of biology and medicine, and did indeed pass. And, uh, and then I uh, talked about his, uh, how he has formed his group, and then the, all the success stories, and, and, and concluded saying that we at the Beckman Institute are honored that the 20 year long journey of TCBG has been taken with us. We are also tremendously proud that the Klaus Schulten has been the guiding light for that journey along the frontiers of science. And we hope he and his group continue their quests here for many years and decades to come. And, and in fact, that is materialized. Uh, so around the same time, uh, we had uh, 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 the director of the Beckman Institute always gives the, the state of the the institute address, and, and Jeff has either done that or will be doing it. And, uh, and you highlight some of the, the research accomplishments of the institute. And this was the 20th year, so it was a very special year. And, and I was going over my slides that I had used at the uh, State of the Union address, State of the Institute address, if you might call it, and, and talked a lot about the computational microscope. Uh, that, that Klaus and his group had, had developed. And, uh, and this is from the state of the Beckman Institute. Everything is happening in September, September the 24th. So the, again, uh, during that year, we had uh, every year the Beckman Institute is an annual report. And in the annual report, you highlight uh, some of the achievements of the past year. And that was again the 20th year, so we had to go back and talk about the 20 years of accomplishments of the Beckman Institute. Of course, the, the highlight was uh, Klaus and, and, and his contributions. So this is a, a page from that uh, annual report. Of course, you won't be able to, uh, uh, to read it, uh, but uh, uh, it was called the Schulten uh, Living His Dream at Beckman. And, and which was a very appropriate thing. And, and then there is uh, this thing, which is subtitle, which you cannot read, but I'll blow up for you. And, and what he says is that if I wasn't in love with living systems and trying to learn about them, I would have become a pure mathematician. I guess this is back at Münster, when, where he graduated. We actually talked a lot uh, about uh, his uh, sort of undergraduate and graduate life. In fact, it turns out that we overlapped at Harvard for a year and a half. And then the minister was a city that I frequently visited when I was spending a sabbatical year at Twente. So, so there was uh, these, these memories and, and common things that we discussed. But he says, he continues, I would never be going to be a mathematician, but I couldn't see myself only in the world of mathematics, I wanted to apply this logical thinking and approach to living systems. And, and indeed, uh, uh, he has done just that uh, to an amazing uh, degree. And uh, uh, so uh, the other thing, this is something that, that uh, Ted Brown has uh, uh, mentioned, Klaus, uh, uh, and uh, did uh, knock on the doors of the of the director, and uh, quite frequently with with demands. Uh, some of them uh, seemed uh, quite difficult to, to achieve, but they were all very well thought out, and 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 always had a had an angle where it would contribute. And uh, if you meet these demands, it would contribute to progress at the Beckman Institute. And, and, and would set examples for other groups as well. So one of these was, uh, uh, one day he came and he said, well, I, I have a uh, sort of a, a, a novel uh, idea about how we should reconfigure the space that we have at the Beckman Institute. And, and he, he was really uh, not only thinking of the well-being of his group in terms of scientific achievements and developments, but also the environment that he creates for them so that it will be much more conducive. 
and it said, I, I want some open space, and then there were cubicles at the time, and, uh, and maybe you know, some groups still had cubicles, and he said, we want to tear them down and then open the space so that we can have free sort of, uh, 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 we can walk around and have our meetings in the open and so on. So it sounded very reasonable, uh, and, uh, and uh, I was able to find the resources, and we went ahead with, uh, with these plans. And in June uh, 2009, that was completed, the remodeling. And then he sent me a very, very nice uh, letter. And, uh, and it was a long letter to H. He was extremely pleased. He actually invited me to the uh, space where to one of his group meetings. But, uh, but I want to, I mean, uh, you can see that he's thinking that he was thinking of his group and how it really uh, makes it a much better uh, space for his group. But uh, uh, the interesting thing here, here is that which I have highlighted, and perhaps more than we care to admit, the work of science is fueled by caffeine and carbohydrate, which the new kitchenette area allows us to easily support. So there was a non-scientific element to it, and which definitely contributed to the development of, of science. So, uh, so this is, uh, 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 as far as the, my recollections, I mean, there are many more, but in the limited time, uh, this is where I will leave Beckman and then the, um, and, uh, go fast forward to the Center for Advanced Study. And uh, Klaus was elected to the Center in 2013. And uh, as you know, the Center is, uh, election is, is one of the highest honors the campus bestows upon its faculty, and the election process itself is very rigorous and thorough. Uh, many letters are collected from uh, uh, well-known names in the field, including Nobel laureates, which was no exception in Klaus's case. I uh, think at least two Nobel laureates vote on his behalf. The center goes back to 1959, so uh, it is 30 years older than, than, the, uh, than the Beckman Institute actually will be uh, celebrating the uh, 60th anniversary in, in two years. The, uh, so what I would like to share with you is some of the, again, excerpts, paragraphs from some of the letters, uh, and, and uh, there were eight of them, and uh, they were all international recognized names uh, who wrote on his behalf, and they all painted a, a portrait of a, a brilliant, visionary, and, and productive scholar. So some of the statements, uh, one, one of the letter writers said, uh, I guess this is no longer confidential, and I'm not revealing the names either. Uh, given uh, Professor Schulten's many outstanding contributions to science, as well as his ongoing work in research, I consider him to be one of the extremely few scientists who have truly changed the world. And another uh, letter writer says, an overarching characteristic of his work has been his ability to develop models for biological processes suitable for a theoretical analysis and for making testable predictions applying his vast and thorough knowledge of physics. He's a biophysicist by excellence. And a third one uh, said his elegant computations provide a deep view into the biophysics at the molecular level. Such a view is absolutely essential for any complete understanding of biological processes and all the potential medical benefits that might evolve from such understanding. The fourth one said, it has not escaped my attention with the tremendous public service he has provided by freely sharing his computational tools. I believe that over 200,000 registered uh, users rely on his software. This was in 2009. I heard here at the symposium that it now exceeds 300,000. And, uh, and the last one that I have picked here is, uh, says, remarkably, while Klaus's initial creative insights in the areas of theoretical and computational biophysics and quantum mechanical analysis of visual pigments 
and photosynthetic harvesting of light energy by plants were published some decades ago. Klaus continues to provide critical insights with publications on each of these topics in 2012. So these were all wonderful, glowing uh, letters. So we were greatly honored at the center to include Klaus among our events. We were even more impressed with his generosity of time and advice. And this is not only an honorific position, but, but, but what comes with it uh, is some responsibility. You have to contribute to the activities at the center at the highest level and, and serve on committees and so on. And Klaus did all of that. Uh, we looked at the center forward to enjoy many more years of Klaus's active participation in our various programs, but unfortunately he passed away. It was with great sadness that we received the news. He left behind the record, which is impossible to fill. Well, thank you. It's someone who doesn't work in good area. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> right, so I think you all met uh, Professor uh, Jeff Moore. He's our best director. And I'm sure Klaus also did him up for a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <coughs> Yes, Klaus did hit me up. I became the interim director in uh, April of 2016, and uh, in May I got the knock on the door. So it didn't take uh, it didn't take Klaus too long. Um, uh, I want to share with you uh, just a few perspectives, though. That I I was mostly uh, I would describe it as um, an elevator buddy of Klaus's. Uh, what I mean by that is we both uh, work on the third floor of the Beckman Institute. So um, my most frequent encounters with Klaus, at least prior to um, to uh, uh, being the interim director, was uh, was to ride up and down the elevator with him and occasionally um, have conversations about science, but sometimes uh, not, and sometimes no conversations at all, because he was clearly focused on uh, um, what was um, the business of the day. And, uh, and and so he was, but it was a lot of fun, and we did get to know each other um, in those brief encounters, but uh, many frequent encounters. Um, the uh, the comments I want to share with you, though, really are what's happened, um, you know, since May of, of, of 2016 when he first knocked on my door, and then a little bit about um, what, what's happened since then, and, um, and the impact that he has clearly left behind both on the institute and how he, you know, to be the final of the directors that will speak about Klaus, really has uh, positioned the institute for everything that Ted had in his vision of what this place was going to be and how that that's going to continue to last going forward. A after Klaus passed, um, I sent out a message and, and met many of his students and postdocs individually, just to make sure that you know, from an uh, uh, outsider's perspective, everything was under control to the best as possible, that they were being taken care of, that they found um, a new advisor, and that they felt like they were on track still to completing their degree. And in those meetings that I had, the number one thing that came through was uh, that what was going to be missed most was that uh, interaction that the students had with Klaus, that uh, passion of science that he was able to give them. And it's not that it couldn't be replaced by other advisors to some degree, but it was just something special that Klaus took uh, under his wing. And this was published in our um, uh, 2016 annual report. And you know what it does is really capture the idea that this was a partnership. That is, the, the, the research that was done by the students was 
Yeah, it had Klaus's fingerprint all over it, but for sure it was uh, uh, the student being able to take ownership of that project, Klaus giving that to them, and that's the kind of way that he nurtured students and postdocs in this group, and those are some of the kinds of conversations that I got from those trips up and down <coughs> on the elevator. So. Uh, I know that Klaus wasn't just devoted to the research group. And I've had many uh, Saturday morning at farmer's market encounters with Zan as well. And uh, you know there was always an update when Klaus was sick or there was a, um, you know, some comment and it was clear that their relationship was very special and um, it was what made uh, life worth living to be, uh, to be, to be perfectly frank. So he was deeply devoted to the people in his life, but um, there was no doubt that he taught us how to be individually excellent and also to be a collaborator. The individual excellence comes through on the, the Scholten line. And what the Scholten line is, is uh, both of these are, are plots of publication metrics. Um, first, all of them have publication metrics that identify the Beckman Institute as uh, um, uh, the organizational affiliation. And so mm -hmm. Klaus published more papers than the ones that are, are, are shown here from his times elsewhere. But uh, these are his contributions just from 1989 and onward. And so uh, total number of publications number of, against number of years at the Beckman Institute, uh, clearly, Klaus was president of the Beckman Institute ever since the beginning, so he extends all the way but, uh, to the far right. But of course, what's uh, so impressive is that um, that uh, point on the top there uh, is matched by no one, and the extrapolated line, the Schulten line, as I came to call it, uh, is um, untouched by, by anyone else. The, uh, the line on the left is um, just as impressive. It's an H index of over 100. For once again, that's an H index of publications that only have an acknowledgement of the Beckman Institute. And so that is not the Schulten H index. That's his Beckman H index. And uh, once again, years at Beckman, you can see that he's virtually untouched. There seems to be some young gun at uh, eight or nine years um, who's uh, um, doing quite well. And, uh, and, and, but for the most part, once again, it's the Schulten line that defined excellence at the Beckman Institute. So no doubt he was uh, individually as well as collaboratively everything that we aspire to be. And he sets the bar very high for everyone else to try to, uh, to, to emulate. But the other thing, um, Tamar mentioned it actually, he, he taught us how to collaborate. It, it actually took a, us a long time to figure it out. You, you had it like when Klaus came down and, and told you like, hey, this is a better way of arranging the space. And within maybe six months or so, I don't know how exactly long it took, uh, the innovation courtyard came to be uh, actually number one and number two. and. Uh, and, and that was, you said, 2009, I believe. And so you know, it took us almost 10 years later before the rest of the Beckman Institute recognized how valuable that kind of collaborative interaction would be. And uh, fortunately, we were motivated by a carpet project. Um, and our goal then was to tear down the cubicles and try to emulate, to some degree, uh, the space that Klaus had so effectively put into place. And you're seeing pockets of that now. It's, continue, it's a continuing experiment and project. Different groups want different things. But I would say, for sure, uh, uh, that line that, that, that Tamar showed, uh, also I captured as well, he's clearly living out the dream that not only Klaus, uh, Klaus's dream, but I think it's the dream of many people who are here at, at the Beckman Institute. And so we definitely thank him for that. <coughs> Finally, uh, I, I think what I'd like to say in, uh, as, as the la one of the last points is uh, the legacy that has been left by Klaus. 
A year after his passing, we had a review, uh, which we have for each of the programs at the Beckman Institute. And it's a blue ribbon panel that uh, comes in and scrutinizes the programs that are going on here. You could have easily imagine, and in fact, in the review report that I received, that uh, the review took place in October, you could imagine that uh, there would be turmoil and it doesn't look like there's a pathway forward. But uh, both Zan and, and Ahmad, you have really picked up the pieces that were already in place, but you knew how to do it because um, I think you had seen it in action and Klaus's legacy was clearly um, left behind and the confidence that the, the committee put forth is reflected in uh, this directed, lift, these quotes lifted directly from the report, described the group as, as world-leading, impactful, taking applications, taking science and converting it into applications that, that the world is using, and a model for what success in the Beckman Institute uh, should be. And so, uh, you know, it, it is clear that the future is bright, and, and it's uh, in bright in great part because of what Klaus put into place. And just um, uh, uh, follow, to follow up on this point, the knock that I got on my door in May of 2016 was Klaus uh, preparing for the uh, NIH review and again asking for what can the Beckman Institute do. I know the university has been going through budget cuts for the last several years with the state. Um, his, his ask was a, uh, again, it reflects what he valued and it was about the people. Can I, can I get some matching funds to help support the people in my group? And, and, uh, and so we were definitely able to help him. And, uh, and, and, and another example of legacy, the amazing results from uh, the NIH review that just came off without it, which you, you guys really do know how to give a great presentation about your science. That is really uh, very impressive. So finally, to wrap up, I'll go back to uh, Ted Brown's uh, original proposal from the Beckman Institute. This was in the mid-'80s, uh, sent to the Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation. And uh, it's captured in this highlight, I think, the, what, what Ted had envisioned the Beckman Institute would be and how Klaus really made that vision uh, come to life. Uh, he was looking for individual excellence and intense interaction among the faculty at the forefront of a broad spectrum of different disciplines. And the different disciplines, you've read this before, it's in your brochure, but I am always inspired every time I get a chance to see this and uh, think about that really does define what it means to be living your dream at the Beckman Institute, to be this interdisciplinary person where you don't know what to call yourself Am I a physicist? Am I a chemist? Am I a mathematician? Um, no label really uh, uh, captures that broad interest that, that, uh, that, that Klaus was able to capture and assimilate on the third floor of the Beckman Institute. And so uh, I, I would like to just conclude uh, with uh, uh, the following statement. So this has been an amazing uh, couple of days. And, uh, and so first, I'd like to thank the organizing committee uh, for getting this together and, and really putting on an amazing tribute to Klaus. And uh, the second thing I'd like to do is to acknowledge the staff, and especially Patty Jones, who really um, was uh, the heavy lifter behind a lot of the organization. But it wasn't just Patty, it was uh, many of the Beckman Institute staff as well. And so thank you so much. For all that.
taxi driver, you name it, whatever we needed, that Patty was doing. So thank you all again. Okay, so now we're going to start with the uh, morning program. Um, uh, the first to speak will be a room to one of the collaborators uh, on people taxes. And, and I, I don't have the title of your talk, but I think you must be talking about flying away on my cross. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my name is Peggy. I, do, I was a uh, um, um, a year ago, I was still at the University of Pittsburgh, and I just recently relocated to the UK, University of Oxford, and, and also took up on a directorship of the uh, UK National Crime Center at the uh, Dan Sinkertron, Dan Mesos. So it's truly, truly a great honor to be here to share some of the uh, work that we did with the class. I first worked with the class of, um, around 2011, much later than many of you um, here in the audience. So at that time, um, um, so Kung Fu Zhao, my co-host, who just arrived at Ada uh, Armstrong, um, quite young dancing member of the Caps Assembly, and um, in this, uh, so this is a pre-direct uh, elect, direct, electron detector era. So we collect the uh, images on um, photograph, take a film, and then scan it into the computer, and then go through image processing. So finally, I love at Ada and Strong by combining many, many, many children assemblies. So within this uh, assembly, we um, have can visualize really clearly the individual upper helices within well, the capsule, actually the capsule hexamer. And then you can see those individual blobs just represent all in, um, a single upper helices. And then you can see these two upper helices connecting to adjacent hexamers uh, as the angular first stay uh, eroded as it was uh, um, the helix number nine that forms the dangling surface. So at this point, we would like to build a comic model of this, of this uh, um, CAPS assembly. But um, the, all the existing crystallography um, uh, models, the, the X-ray models, doesn't fit into this assembly very well because uh, the crystallography is uh, all planar crystals with a six-fold symmetry. Well, this is a highly curved structure. It's very asymmetric. So, uh, so we really need uh, um, uh, some computational expertise and a computational modeling in order to arrive um, at the atomic structure of this guy. So when I um, when I talked to Angela about our problem with this, and she just said, "Oh, there's only one person you need to talk to, which is a cross shooter." So, well, I'm truly, really um, forever grateful for Angela uh, brought us together, and um, uh, after this, we have uh, not only just a capsule, but we have uh, many, many other collaborative work, work and, um, including chemo Texas as well, uh, coming from um, our collaborative efforts. So, um, so we, um, we, so this is, was a, uh, um, so Huang, actually, who at that time just joined the class group uh, as a flashy postdoc, um, and then he took up on this uh, challenging project and uh, worked with many workers of Kung Fu. So we, um, um, we got a got map and uh, um, Huang fit it into the tubular structure or as a model. And that's all, because the tubular assembly, as Angela first day explained it, and it's all have hexamer hexamer interaction. So um, Juan also did the MD simulation, extracting the hexamer configuration, replaced by a pentamer, and simulated with the pentamer interacting with the five hexamers, and then like the hexamer and the pentamer interface. So here's the difference. The tube, so it's a, when it's in tubular ship or hexama, it's a cylindrical. And when you have a pentama included in the center, it becomes a dome structure, dome like structure. It's, so it curves the surface. It makes a curvature by including a pentama. 
And that pattern, I guess, is look I to close the um, conical shape of cap capsid that they enclose the viral genome. So we have those structures, so all the interactions, and then we also have identified a trauma interface um, that uh, existed. So this is a novel new trauma interface just uh, identified through this uh, modeling process. And, uh, they exist in between the three hexamas or between the hexamas and the pentamas, but they are clearly show some difference. The blue one shows the trauma interface half derived from hexama, and then you can see the R shows the pentama. So you can clearly see the pentama trauma in the in the, in the, in the, in the um, this configuration, the trauma interface is a much heavier effect compared to um, the the all hexama configuration. So with all this, it's really nice. Um, um, uh, and all the interface, actually, we, we also got, went with uh, um, Presec and did all the validations of the interface and mutations on the interface. So it's, it's really a very nice story. So we put up to um, submit to Nature, and the review comes back is really positive and really nice. The editors also love the story. But they come with a one count, say. So uh, now you have all the tools, and uh, um, you, um, you know you have all the tools. So why don't you go for the big one, the big, the complete viral capsid? Um, so, uh, so that 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 of course this is a non-trivial task. But as you um, as of course if we just put up, uh, if we said now just put up this structure to nature, of course they will accept it. But then when I discuss with the class to say, what do, you, what do you think about this? And as you will know, so this is a story about Klaus being fierce, go big, going big. So he said, well, we should put out our best one to the world, and that, um, to, to a best one out and a best one to the world. Of course, so this is a, the next two months, of world, it was just exactly was so intense and so <laughs> incredible. Luckily, we got a blue water um, 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 uh, right for the, in the test space, and then uh, Juan get a lot of access through the blue water. So over the, uh, the uh, next month, so Kung Fu had a spring many, um, uh, the capsid prep, uh, the um, viral core purpose of uh, sent by Chris Satan. So those core purposes are very fragile, shooting from long distance. Many of them are all broken, and uh, we screen many of them until we find uh, an, an, an impact, an, a good uh, impact of viral course to do, to acquire the tomography data. And uh, and uh, Huang had to, of course, uh, um, figure out the configuration. With, um, there's uh, how many hexamas and uh, where, where the pentamas are located to exactly match the um, cloud tomography data in order to build the atomic structure. So we've been doing this like intensely for two months. We almost uh, talked day day later. Actually, most of the time happens in the midnight or uh, past midnight, two o'clock in the morning. There's a was a late person. <laughs> So at the end, uh, we are so we are, of course we are very glad to arrive with an uh, atomic structure or atom structure with the 216 isomer 12 pentamers in that structure, and the simulation took the weeks. I think in in in, in blue water, so in order to arrive structure, and uh, of course uh, I I got my first nature cover, which is uh, really wonderful to have <laughs> to have, but. Um, this is our first collaboration. Um, this is on top of that, um, started 2011, paper publishing on 2013. Um, but we didn't stop there. We, um, we carried on and I had many, many more collaborative projects. Uh, the next one was 2015, was, uh, uh, again, with uh, Klaus and um, this was on vector chemotaxis. So this is the main topic I'm going to talk about today. On that the chemotaxis um, with a quality electron tomography and the in situ structure. And then we also worked on um, the uh, host restriction factors, uh, host potential factors that interact with the viral capsid. But uh, this, so the legacy continues uh, across the past away. We uh, also worked with the uh, Zen and uh, um, Case as well as um, Huang, continue to um, to do more collaborative work and have uh, some more results. So I can briefly touch upon uh, just the two um, two host factors that we worked together. One is a. Uh, um, um, this is a slice and ratio um, on the first day that uh, so this is a blue sea upper um, uh, area here is a wall of host um, 
the um, interior of uh, several several vectors and uh, uh, set, um, uh, protein complexes. So two of those vectors, like we talk about, one is like the filament, is actually potentially infected that uh, promotes HIV infection. Well, the other one, I can talk about is the MSV, uh, which is a, a restriction factor that blocks HIV infection. So both of us also um, work with the uh, uh, cross uh, after we had the capsule structure. So cytopenin A, um, so this work was done by a postdoc um, and uh, together with Huang. Cytopenin A is a, um, a whole cell factor. It's a protein um, protein isomerase. It is, it's a highly conserved, it is in most cell types. But no one really knows what it's doing. Even it was a number for more than 30 years, just that no one knows its cellular function. That asthmatic function is no one really doesn't know, uh, or no one really could figure out what it's doing in the cell. But it was fun to um, actually promote uh, HIV infection in certain cell types. And uh, then um, about uh, 20 years ago, um, the, uh, the crystal structure of the cytopenin A, together with the uncommitted male for the capsule, uh, is being determined. And then it's known to the cytopenin A uh, promote HIV infection is through binding to the viral capsule, through the cytopenin binding domain, and the disease function. But the crystal structure, binary crystal structure, doesn't explain how cytopenin A stabilizes the viral capsule, which was known in the field for, for a long time. So until we arrive this uh, a complex structure, uh, which is a, a set, so the cytopenin A bound to the capsule assembly using Crowley-M, and as you can see, this is the cytopenin density um, bridging across the two viral uh, two capsule hexamers in the assembly, and then. What surprises us is that this cytopenin A actually doesn't bind every single capsule um, or uncommon domain the cytopenin group of the viral capsule assembly in the hexamine, but prefer preferentially binding along one direction, which is the most curved direction. So we want so by cross bridging cross this. So we want to understand why cytopenin has such a preference and what is it doing there. Now we can dock the cytopenin density into the density map, and it can only fit one cytopenin, as shown here. So how did one single cytopenin bind? Okay, for instance, one hexima and one capsule protein. But how this has this such a preferential, preferential binding and pattern? And how this uh, um, this binding bridge across and stabilize the capsule. Only until a form did a molecular dynamic simulation and then identify a second binding set here. And then this is a, a different from this canonical binding set, which exists in the crystal structure. This is second binding set actually uh, interact with uh, exactly the same group, the cytophilin binding group, but um, cytophilin uses the other phase to interact. So a single cytophilin has two interaction phases to bridge across the two hexamers and by binding to, to, um, to CA molecule here. And then when, when I go through the very old um, first, um, the, uh, PDB data bank and I found this uh, um, probably 30 year old structure, which is a, uh, uh, this is a structure, this complex of cytophilin with the free one, the cytosporin A, which is an immunosuppressor drug that uh, um, the crystal, the co-crystals with cytopenin A, as you can see, the uh, cytosporin A actually advanced the exactly same position as, a, as the um, cytopenin group here. And this is a drug that actually can prevent and to, uh, um, to replace cytopenin um, binding to, uh, uh, replace the group for cytopenin group uh, to improve and disrupt the cytopenin binding to the HIV cats. So that so that was published uh, Nature this called company, Nature Communication 2016. But we meanwhile we were also working this restriction factor called MSD. MSD is a uh, a member of a dynamic um, larger GTPS and super family member. And uh, it's a homework of MXA has a um, is a uh, a known for for a long time restricts many, many viruses, including flu virus. But only uh, no one knows what is MS um, Although we know the problem for a long time, only about three or four years ago, three independent 
and the book and the MXD actually the stress actually. I mean, so we went on the under structure of MXD in the assembly state. And this is a typical GTPA, actually GTPA assembly into typical structures. So it's one stack it is. And you can see the bottom. So this is a, a we call the resolution map, uh, a local resolution map. The center part is a highly ordered about four instrument resolution, while the GTPS domain on the offering is a less well ordered. So this is about, this is made out of six MXD diamonds to form such assembly. Now, Juan um, has, so this work was done by Francis you know, and Juan together. So Juan did the uh, uh, MD FF and then uh, taking the MXD crystal structure, which is uh, missing uh, internal, uh, actually, unterminal important bits of the MSD, which the advanced biocaps, and with also mutations there that prevents all optimization. So here, there's, there's a, uh, yes, to do, uh, the MD shows the day. Crystal structure has to jiggle a little bit in order to get our density map. And uh, this is actually the jiggle a little bit and the change of conformation actually is uh, large enough to make this complete different interface compared to the initial states of the crystal lattice contact versus uh, this uh, uh, assembly state. And this is essential, the assembly, assembly state is essential for the strict HIV. So we identified the new, new interface, this assembly interface, which is missing in crystal structure, and a test the interface that is a truly, um, so this is a work with uh, Alan Engelman in Harvard. This interface is uh, critical for uh, organization as well as the uh, restriction HIV. So now I'm going to uh, switch the gear. I don't know how much time I have. Um, Okay, so I have to do quick. So talk about back to chemo Texas. So there's also a story associated with this. When I, when we were working with Cross on the uh, HIV capsules project, so uh, Cross invited me over for, for a seminar. It was a, a stormy, a snow, a stormy day when I came in and I arrived in Chicago Airport. All the flights were canceled uh, to, to anywhere to Havana Champion as well. So I, I, I. Um, drank the SUV, drove through, store, uh, through the snow, snowstorm, took me six hours to get a ride to the Obama champion, so it was a way past midnight. And the next day I showed up on the seminar. Klaus was really impressed that he saw I could cancel the seminar, but I guess I impressed him quite a bit at this moment. <laughs> So when he asked me what else I work on, I said I also work on back to him and told him about um, back to him no Texas. So he he actually asked me to give a second seminar about back to him no Texas. And for, for sure, next morning uh, when when we met him uh, for breakfast, the class uh, took a took a um, took a kiss. Uh, uh, with him and say, oh, so this is a perfect project for kids. And he was a third year graduate standard student, and the previous project didn't work well. So uh, since then, kids has been working with us uh, on the chemo Texas. So um, it's also been very enjoyable. Um, in, 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 so um, uh, the tool uses uh, um, the chemo Texas system to um, detect the environment, the senses of food, or detect the uh, toxin or hazardous. Um, environment to swim away or swim towards it. This is all accomplished through these uh, array of member receptors uh, together with uh, a histamine kinase molecule. And they are only um, few thousand receptors are only only um, well, only um, cluster or localized at the polar region of the cell and form almost a perfect lattice at the polar region of the cell. Um, that was a year, um, so years ago when I first know when I was a post um, postdoc at the uh, Shiam Subramanian's lab at the NH. At that time, we took um, we took the live cell in the culture put on and grid and collect um, from the base collect the tomography data. This is a, a low, very low resolution tomography data, but shows that the clusters are only concentrate and uh, the receptor and the TA molecules are only concentrated at the very polar region of small patch. Uh, the resolution is really low. We cannot identify individual receptor or TA tennis molecule. The whole apparatus actually is organized in a way that the receptors are elongated and the receptors 
They received the signal of Leiden and went to Leiden from Paracast domain and talked to the Canis molecule, which is a dimer, quite big, 75 kg. And that Canis molecule phosphorates uh, and the downstream signaling, downstream signaling molecule Ky, that transmit the signal to vaginal mother and it pays the vaginal mother the rotation whether the um, vector will tumble or swim. So this is the core signaling complex, uh, the essential component, uh, composed of a receptor dimers. Uh, homodimers and the trimers could be mixed uh, different uh, receptor trimers. Then the, uh, connected by the Ki-A dimer in blue and a co vector uh, in green. <coughs> and as a whole, whole thing, the whole complex uh, actually form a lattice uh, type of structure and connect with each other. So this is how um, the receptor gets a such a huge application. It depends less than 1% of the nutrients and it buys the entire cluster. And they are also building an adaptation system that can sense the five logs of uh, dynamic arrangement with the same sensibility. So we want to understand how the signal transduction going through from um, the pericast to the binding all the way transmit to the tip of receptor, talk to kinase kind of molecule, and the, um, and the phosphorus the downstream. Mm. Uh, structure. I forgot to mention this is the unicell of the cluster, and then there's a, a difference is that if you see those rings, there's a six fold rings and the three fold rings. Depends on whether they are uh, OK molecules here or W molecules here. But we want to understand so the signal transduction and also how the signals are not only trans transduced through the receptor in the chemistry interaction, but also transmitted across the levels. So we first took an in vivo approach and looked at the bacteria cells in, in naked condition um, on the chemo, with the chemotaxis already in there. Um, however, as I showed you previously, the bacteria is really thick, more than half a micron thick, so the electron beam can't really a digital go through and get a meaningful signal to uh, analyze the receptor. Uh, array. So we devise a method that we use a phage gene called E gene. E gene is a phage lysis gene. We engineered it, uh, we took it from Phyx 174 phage E gene and uh, put it into the plasma. And by, uh, the moment that we're ready to uh, freeze the bacteria, we induce E gene. E gene will, will make it, will actually inhibit the MRA, uh, the pepper de uh, directing layer in the bacteria, in, in color cells, and uh, to make a lesion in the membrane. So all the all the cytoplasm, the ribosomes, the DNA, are all gone, and only left with uh, with just the uh, the two membranes, the inner outer membrane, of course, with the chemo receptor erasing there. So we take those cells, collect the electron to multilayer. As you can see, so you clearly show now, um, this is an unlike cell, so it's very thick, very dark, hard to look through, and this is the light cell. It's just a ghost. So you will appreciate how much information we can gain from these nice to go cells. So this is what we typically gain with the receptors arranged uh, uh, in the polar region of the membrane. And this is what we get with the light cell. You can clearly see the clear lattice arrays so nicely and uh, arrange the, uh, the receptor arrays in the membrane. So we we now pushing through, try to get through, uh, pushing through this in vitro, in vivo, chemoreceptor structures using tomography. But meanwhile, um, because this uh, array, in vivo arrays still have many protein components embedded in the cell, uh, there are other membrane proteins, uh, the adapted proteins, the PR and uh, uh, and KB, and many others. So we uh, uh, took another approach um, to look at the um, um, really pure system. So we purified the, all three components and um, um, uh, using lithium monomer to mimic the receptor orientation within the membrane, and I have a key and a key that will bump the receptor to, and the form is also uh, in vitro uh, receptor arrays, uh, this is one of the receptor arrays. So this has, entry group has been really challenging. It burned two, uh, two postdocs in there, in their work in order to get this receptor arrays. It has to be a perfect ratio between the receptor, uh, the nickel lipid, we have a histac receptor, the three components of both the core com secondary complex. Back then, we don't have like a crystal to be checked to screen all the conditions. So it's all the men. Then, then 
that I would have measured. So finally, we got those uh, in vitro arrays, and then we collected tomography data, as you can see here. You know, we are slicing through the tomograms uh, of those arrays. They are not perfect. That's what uh, we couldn't do 2D crystallography. They have to do um, tomography. But within these arrays, um, this work was a Ben's work now, um, my graduate student. So he can pick out the individual, um, individual uh, what we call the hexamers of recept receptor tremors, and the individual unit. So we can't imagine he can automatically get a pick up hundreds and thousands of those individual unit and sort it out by um, classification of these individual three <coughs> unit. Although when he picks up the receptors all look like a hexamers. But there are differences in the TA configuration. And there are TAs on tremors uh, configuration or hexamer configuration of the TA. And then there are also some um, um, uh, say, uh, defects on the TA assembly in, in those areas. That's why you see the voids and the non perfect lattice. So, um, so, so you will be able to map out those uh, configuration back to the original array. And you can see that it's not so well in this image, but you can see orange is actually the hexamer unit, and then the sign is the tremor unit. You can see they are alternating orange, and the orange is surrounded by three, by six of these um, 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 sign ones, and one is surrounded by three. So it's either a three-fold tremor, a so three-fold or six-fold. So he was able to separate those uh, classified different configurations. And also, this was also done in the native receptor array, and uh, the map, the low resolution and best map uh, uh, overlaps very well. So indicates this in vitro array really, really represent, represents the in vivo cluster. So he was able to um, align the structure using existing um, tomography software for subatomogram classification and averaging. And this is the Elan Astro map for three fold. He, uh, he collects 3,000 of units of this. And the six fold is about uh, three, only 300 units. 300 units <laughs> about 17 Astro gas map. And then his, um, his took those. Uh, um, Build a three, uh, build a, uh, the three by three unit cell lattice uh, by taking those structures of the overlapping three, uh, six, overlapping uh, three fold and six fold build the, the lattice and then uh, uh, get an MD simulation of this. And then uh, when he extracts one of the uh, core segment unit from here through the MD trajectory, and here shows here, so this is a receptor here, and this is a one single receptor dimer, three of them here, three of them there, and the TA molecule in blue. And the simulation shows the TA part is very dynamic. And you show, we, uh, he started with a symmetric um, the people domain there, and ends up with the people domain different. And the impression that is reformed through is a P4 and a P3 domain, which was also the first time visualized by Fabian here. So we um, especially this uh, RG297, which is a similar, uh, in this situation, we use a Simotoga model. But we test me in Colab, which is R265, and then um, all the ending location to this. Um, residual actually kills in the vector uh, functionality and only the well that shows the small. So this is all really truly indicates that MD simulation allows uh, we look at the dynamics of the um, the signaling um, process and then be able to infer those uh, those uh, um, dynamics and then uh, new interfaces uh, um, being validated by uh, through the through the functional assay. Now when ben, ben was working on this project as his PhD thesis project, but this is as much as he can push for it. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he so using existing software. So he, the last two years of his thesis, he decided to develop a whole new. Uh, he knew, we knew uh, what is the limitation, what is the bottleneck in order to push it, the tomography into much higher resolution in, you know, in order to visualize the hemisphere or even better to, to uh, closer to a single particle kind of resolution. So we developed a whole new software called EM Clarity. I'm not going to go into details of this. Uh, um, he made many, different, many advances in the software, all shown in red. And the two major cross uh, 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 modules he had on is the, uh, the Tomo PCR, which refines the tomography tier series much better using the individual sample tomo as a fiducial marker instead of a fiducial <laughs> 
And also, we use water scale PCA in, con in conjunction with 3D CPF to, to, um, um, to uh, minimize the missing material <laughs> that, the, that Elizabeth has eroded to, um, in, to, to get a better classification. So, that's to show the result. So, this is, uh, um, he, took, he tested his software using the public available data. Um, our entire data uh, deposited uh, by uh, first of all, uh, first data set that deposited by source in uh, 2016 using Redown. So this is what the Redown class shows. It shows three classes, two are similar ones, and the one is a junk class that they exclude. And uh, using exactly the same data set that using Brent's ENIB, he was able to uh, classify the ribosome molecules, I forgot to mention. So it you know, was able to um, to differentiate that the L1, so there were many ribosome talks. So the L1 protrusion, <coughs> you can set those conformations, the open, intermediate, or closed conformation, as well as the uh, EX extent, EX 27, also shows a different conformation. And then this is not only you can uh, classify all those different conformations that form just uh, two southern ribosome molecules. But also, he was able to push the resolution from initial 13 astron to 8.1 astron, 8, 8 astron resolution. And this is just a chart that shows the individual step he has implemented progressively to push the resolution to the final one. So this is a lateral map uh, with the um, initial 13 astron resolution, and this is the final map, exactly the same data set, okay? Um, to be able to visualize the helix and the RNA molecules. So, he also tested uh, with another data set. This is actually a uh, uh, data set from Baumaster's lab uh, with a rapid, a, uh, rapid, rapid variable and also was able to push it from 11 to 9 strong resolution. And then he actually worked up, uh, so we work on electronic immature particles. So uh, uh, we collect the just as a test case, we collect 10 tomograms. And then uh, about three in each tomogram, we got 6,000 sub volumes, 30 particles. And then he was able to determine the uh, individual gag molecule. It's uh, before the cleavage to become CA, so it's a spherical particle, to a 6.7 <coughs> national resolution using subatomic mm -hmm. averaging classification. So mm -hmm. you can clearly see the alpha helix is an extremely well resolved. So with this, um, I think that, so this is what, um, so since that, uh, where we are going, since I moved to Diamond and uh, Oxford, we are trying to set up a, a correlative integrated workflow at Diamond, and then using a um, correlative um, cloud, um, um, progressive microscopy, with the cloud data, cosmography, together with a cloud field meaning that uh, Elizabeth has talked us, uh, give us a lot of insight on this. The first test specimen we had was uh, 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 to look at uh, the mitochondrial morphologies in, in the healthy and the disease uh, patient samples. Uh, so this is a control. The mitochondrial shows a very nice uh, crystal, everything looks good. And this patient sample has a really deformed and, uh, 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 and uh, ugly, or say, uh, mitochondrial morphology. But this is mainly due to the mutation in ATP synthesis, a single mutation there. So we want to understand how this uh, single ATP is uh, um, mutation um, to result in such a drastic effect. Um, so we uh, look at the native uh, visible or real cells from um, healthy, healthy individuals compared to the patient cells. And this is the, um, the field million let us cut, uh, it is cut about and uh, cut into the window, into the uh, internal of the cell, and then you can see this is a mitochondria, and this is actually, so this is data cell, so it's an insulin uh, granule. And uh, all those tomograms show here, the individual, I don't know if you can see well, it's uh, uh, all ATP synthesis time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. molecules. So they, they, we want to understand that in patient cell, we suspect that they become a, a monomer instead of them, so we are doing a 3D subatomic averaging analysis to see the, um, the, the ATP synthesis organization, that, how they affect the, in the morphology. So they, uh, just to show the values of all. Really nice so the family the, the structures are very well so you can even see the lab itself. So with this, I can finish up. Uh, with acknowledgement, uh, uh, the work was mainly then I presented them by Gongbu and uh, um, the King of Texas and uh, um, message <coughs> was done by uh, Ben. Uh, uh, Francis did uh, Francis did the MXB work, 
And um, over the years, I have many wonderful collaborators who are especially um, um, across the children's group here. Uh, thank you so keep uh, kept working with us on the other, uh, on the, uh, as kids as well. Now, one of them has moved to Delaware. And I'm um, really grateful for um, the support from various uh, funding agencies um, as a, uh, in the UK and as well in Trust and uh, So, thanks very much. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> and give that talk. Yeah. 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 Y
uh, that so Klaus present uh, at this recruiting event in the physics department. And he showed this picture and I said, I want to do this. <laughs> right? So quantum mechanics, vision, birds, and, and so on. And I said, this, this sounds cool, right? Um, and then I sent him an email and I will just highlight that I was interested in the quantum biology of vision project, right? And I said, I want to join uh, and you go. So we talked several uh, times, right? And then he said, I have a very exciting project for you in mind and can hardly wait to tell you about it and have you start with us. So that's how I started. I actually skipped the process that the physics uh, students did. He hired me right away on the spot. Um, he was extremely generous, right? But he started to work and it was a mechanical sensing channel. So this was not quantum mechanics at all, right? And the first time that he talked to me about it, I said, oh, this is a material channel. This is kind of boring. Why, why, what am I doing here, right? Um, but then he came and explained how it uh, was supposed to work. But he also said, this is a model of mechanical sensitive channels that actually mediate your sen uh, sense of touch, right? And your sense of hearing. And that got me hooked, actually. That's how I started to actually love this protein and love the project he taught it. And it was a vision that he could see far beyond of uh, what I was seeing just in a simple molecule, right? That actually got me started into this. And I actually ended up working on the biochemistry of hearing because of this project. So we started with the mechanical sensitive channel of small conductance uh, MSCS. We work then on the anterior repeats of uh, trip channels um, and that are also involved on um, mechanical sensation. Then we move on to work on cadence. And uh, we also work with Eric Lee and others on convenience. So we were uh, very productive. We had, uh, I think, uh, 14 papers together. Uh, and it was a really a wonderful experience in terms of uh, our professional uh, work. But it was also a really wonderful experience to work with everybody that I see here. Um, it was hard work. You can see here um, Tim Eastman, Elizabeth, Justin, myself, and Fatima working right before the summer school, the first summer school, where 100 people were coming. And you see how worried we are. <laughs> that was because we were not done with tutorials that 100 people had to use the next day. And Elisa may remember that we were, we didn't sleep, right? We slept on some chairs trying to finish up this, uh, these tutorials. Uh, but Klaus, and Klaus was working with us at the same time, so it was a really a team effort, an extreme effort. And uh, I think that highlights uh, the hard work that we all put in and Klaus with us, but also the generosity that Klaus had in preparing these things for everybody so he could move the field forward. And I think that uh, has been also represented in um, the uh, things that other people have mentioned. But I also want to um, focus, uh, so this is uh, the school, if you like here, you're here, and uh, Klaus is somewhere there. So these hundred people were using our software and uh, actually our tutorials, right? While we were preparing them like an hour before <laughs> they, they were started, right? So it was quite an experience, but we also had, uh, Klaus had a lot of enthusiasm, and we also had a lot of fun. Um, and in this stage, I think Petri put some sort of disco lights, right? And we had a contest about the projects that people were doing during the summer school. And you can see here how we measure who was winning there, right? So you see Elisa and Barry, right? And then people would clap, and I arbitrarily would move the thing, right? <laughs> to evaluate who would win the, the, the contest. Um, so that was uh, a lot of fun. We also ate a lot in the group. I remember uh, multiple celebrations um, and uh, nice uh, times uh, doing in, in the group, right? And also when we were doing um, 
uh, workshops in different places of the U.S. here in Boston, right, where we had, I think, uh, and this was in the Oyster Union, if I remember well, or something like that. Right? Uh, or legal seafood. In the we also went to legal seafood. <laughs> right? um, but also, I have to say that uh, it's not only the enthusiasm and the fun, it was uh, a family that uh, actually welcomed us. Uh, Stan and uh, Klaus, for instance, welcomed uh, myself and my mother uh, the first Christmas after my father had passed away uh, into their home. Uh, Klaus was very enthusiastic, Stan was very welcoming, and that was a very, very nice uh, experience for us, that we're very grateful actually for that. I have to say a little anecdote. Uh, my mother is an artist, and Sam just mentioned this, right? And when we met and I introduced my mother to uh, uh, Klaus, right, um, they started to talk about art and so on. And then um, she showed her some things uh, that, uh, that she had done. And then I think the next day or so, Klaus tells me, I want to buy one of the uh, sculptures from your mother. And for me, it was like, oh no, <laughs> crazy mother, crazy piano, this is not going to work well, <laughs> right? I was super scared, right? That then my mother would make a crazy sculpture, right? And the cows wouldn't like, right? And then I, this was like, oh no, right? That's not what they want to do, especially when they're starting, right? And so on. Yet, I think that was another key um, feature or a characteristic of Klaus, right? That he said she has artistic freedom to do whatever she wants. And I think he did the same thing in each of us, right? And I remember him saying that in group meeting, you have artistic freedom, just get it done, right? Um, so I think those are some of the things that I really appreciate um, uh, from Klaus. Uh, and that uh, I try to keep on uh, in my own group as uh, we move into uh, new territories. So going back uh, to the science, um, now I have deleted this part. It's just molecular dynamics and relations of uh, uh, carrying complexes. And uh, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of what calories are. So, Calerins were discovered in 1974 as cell-cell adhesion molecules. So here on the right, you see cells that are round and that they are touching each other, but they are not really interacting with each other. This is in the absence of calcium. And when you have calcium, you can see that the cells actually kind of merge into uh, one kind of um, uh, set of uh, cells that form a little tissue, a little piece of uh, tissue. That is mediated by cadence. So it's a calcium-dependent cell-cell addition molecule that is on the surface of these cells. These uh, cadence are actually uh, not only responsible for keeping your cells together, but also for sorting out different types of tissues. So you have different cadence, so you have selective um, cells and adhesion, and that allows you to sort and segregate different parts of, uh, of an embryo, for instance, right? And when you have defects in these addition molecules, for instance, you eliminate the nice structures that form, for instance, in the eye, um, in, a, in a fish, for instance, are gone when you have an enthadrine mutant. So these molecules are essential for uh, life. Um, the way they work is intrinsically related to their structure. They have an extracellular domain with what we call five extracellular repeats. Here, the repeats are similar to each other. They are not identical to each other. They have a transmembrane domain and a cytoplasmic domain. The repeats have a typical Ricci uh, motif that is shown here, and there are calcium ions in between the repeats that keep this uh, structure uh, together. Now, this is one polypeptide chain, right, with all these repeats, but the calcium ions are always in between uh, these uh, uh, um, repeats with uh, a coordination by amino acids that are negatively charged, charge these aspartates and glutamates, right? that are conserved throughout uh, uh, all cells. So if you have these EX, EX, DRE, DX, and DN motifs, then you know that you have a cadence because it will have calcium right inside it. Right? 
Now, the way they work is that they expose their extracellular domain here in one cell, and then another cell exposes the same extracellular domain. This is an homophilic interaction, <coughs> strictly selected, right? To form what we call a trans interaction that goes across the uh, separation between the two cells. Um, there are also what we call cis interactions. We have cadets that come from the same cell and kind of patch to form uh, the cis interactions. And these all come uh, in part from uh, biochemical data, but also from crystallographic structures that show how we have a trans interaction, then cis interactions, and then more and more molecules join in to have this uh, a huge set of molecules that form what we call the adherent junction that keeps your cells together. Right? Um, the way that the interaction happens at the very tip is through a concept tryptophan here. It's a finger that comes out of the trophome that inserts into a pocket of the neighboring uh, uh, partner, right? And this is symmetric because we have the same molecule coming from the other side, so then you have the two tryptophans coming together to form uh, this contact, and that's what forms the trans bond um, that uh, mediates adhesion. And of course, Michelangelo knew all of this some time ago, right? And you have this, uh, that's what we call the strand, um, uh, strand exchange or tryptophan exchange uh, interface of the talents. Uh, there are multiple classical talents that use the same type of, uh, of interaction, and all of them have these uh, uh, talent shapes in the train, right? And I remember that uh, when Klaus was preparing his uh, 2015 uh, Biophysical Society meeting grand lecture, right? He asked me for some slides, and I see some of you uh, laughing there, right? Because I told him, so he always loved analogies, right? So you couldn't just talk about molecules, right? You have to provide something that you could grasp, right? And that was easier for other people to see. So I told him, look, these molecules are like the ones that keep yourselves together, and if you don't have them, you become a soup. That was my, my analogy, right? So you're a soup of independent cells. And then some people here in the shoot the lab, they like this. <laughs> so cell, no cadet, and soup, right? <laughs> so that was uh, something that uh, I actually saw only at the biophysical society meeting, right? That, that I saw, uh, that I thought it was like classic Schulten style, right? So that's uh, uh, the analogy that he wanted to have uh, for his presentation. So he also did the pair simulations of cadet. So as Alex said, he was always the pairs there. And um, he pulled on with Deborah Lechtman and Mark Tobias, one of the, uh, uh, the students that uh, they had together. Uh, he pulled very fast, you can see the time scale here, it's 100 picoseconds, right? To see how these uh, cadence would unwind. And this was just a thick EC1 and EC1, right, without the whole thing and so on. And they could see key events and key amino acids that were involved in this uh, process. <coughs> Um, so actually, I took over a little bit on that project because the cadets were also involved on uh, hearing, and um, we simulated another classical cadet with calcium for, I think, this was 10 or 20 seconds back then, uh, 300,000 atoms, 2005, 2006, right? And we saw that this curve shape was maintained as we run the simulation. While when we took out calcium ions, we could see that the repeats were a lot more mobile, and actually uh, the protein was kind of distorted. That was because the calcium ions were keeping this linker very rigid, uh, while when we didn't have calcium ions there, this linker became very floppy and uh, disordered. We illustrated that by looking at what happens when you sit on EC1, for instance, and you look at what happens with the rest of the molecule. So that's aligning the molecule uh, on EC1 and looking at the trajectory and see how the, the rest of the molecule moves. And you see that there is some limited motion when you compare uh, to the APO simulation where you don't have calcium, right? And the same happens when you put uh, potassium and sodium, they do not replace the really calcium. You can do that for each of the repeats, so you can sit on EC2 or sit on EC3, EC4 and EC5 and see how the neighbors are moving, 
right? And you can see that when calcium is not there, the molecule really moves a lot, right? And that was in agreement with what people had observed uh, for Italians with calcium, where you can see these molecules being found with rather straight filaments, but without calcium being curly and actually collapsing on themselves. So that was uh, the beginning of the simulations with and without calcium of cadence, that we thought it was a good starting point because we could kind of reproduce what the experiments had uh, shown before. We also did steer molecular dynamic simulations by which we pulled this protein, and we discovered that calcium was essential also for keeping this, uh, uh, the structural integrity of this uh, um, uh, protein, right? So with calcium, the unfolding force was very large. Without calcium, the unfolding force was very low, and that was actually confirmed later on by AFM experiments. And I think that was one of the things that Klaus really, really liked about uh, some of the work that we did together, is that we always focus on how can we make predictions that then others can test. Then, uh, after uh, I uh, finished with Klaus, I moved on uh, actually to Harvard Medical School to become an experimentalist. I did a trade crystallography. Then I obtained my independent position at Ohio State in 2013. And uh, in my lab, we do both molecular dynamic simulations and um, uh, um, experiments. Actually, we focus more on the experimental side. But uh, because of uh, this uh, uh, symposium, I thought I would focus on some of the simulations that we are trying to do. And that I'm going back to these cadence molecules, right? But now looking not only at one or one PC domain, but at a combination of uh, two complete cadence molecules, right, that are interacting with uh, this filter uh, uh, exchange. Each of these repeats. 100 amino acids, so here we have around 1,000 amino acids. And then the question is, what is the strength of this single trans interaction, right? But now when we have all the repeats there, right? And then, as Klaus uh, would have said, this is not uh, uh, an isolated, isolated set of molecules. It's really uh, a society of molecules, right? That is forming this complex, and we need to really see what is going on when we have all the molecules there, and then we pull apart the planes and try to understand how the forces uh, of the single trans bonds are related when uh, are changed when you have the whole lattice there. So Brandon, a student in my um, in my lab, has put together this lattice, right? And the question is, uh, does the size of the lattice alter the strength? So we have different sizes, right? And also. What happens uh, with the ruptures of the bonds, right? Is it like a Velcro thing in which you peel some parts first and then it goes, right? Or all of them go at the same time and so on. Now, when we were putting this together, we decided to start with just one trans bond that was our uh, first unit, right? So our hydrogen atom. We need to start with one thing, right? And um, we realized that we had not uh, thought this. Uh, too much, too well, right? Because there were two ways in which we could do this. Uh, first, you could have something like this, in which if the cadence is not attached to the cytoskeleton and it can diffuse in the membrane, then whenever you pull, right, it will rot the system will rotate, and then you can pull through this uh, linear direction, right? And you can do the same in the simulation. So you can start when it's already rotated, right, and pull. That's one way of uh, uh, setting up the system. That's what we had done uh, the first time, right? So we had a very long system, very narrow as well, right? And we were ready to pull when we realized, wait, OK, so this is one way of doing it. But we can also do the following. If we think that these uh, transmembrane domains and the cytoplasmic domains are linked to the cytoskeleton, then what we really have to do is something like this. We have to constrain right, the displacement of the planes right, and then pull on this direction uh, to mimic what may be really happening in the cell. And that might also become important when we have many of the molecules together, not just one more. Right? Um, so, uh, Brandon built the system, and 
Unfortunately, when we put it this way, you can see that it's a waste of water, right? So uh, the system is huge, you can barely see here, right? But because of the orientation of the molecules, actually we have a lot of water molecules that are not doing much at the end. So we actually solve that by allowing the molecules to go into the periodic image, right, without touching. And then did uh, simulations in which we compare what happens when we pull in a linear fashion uh, compared to what happens when you pull uh, in the animal. And what we observe is that the forces are slightly different. Um, we do think that in this case, uh, the forces might be lower because you are also putting the constraint forces. So then you're keeping the C terminus of this uh, uh, protein right along uh, uh, a line here, and that also adds energy to the system. And now we are comparing the trajectories to see what is different between the two and what might be happening um, when you have attachment to such a skeleton and when you don't. But then the next step, of course, is what happens when you have the full uh, lattice, right, with um, uh, your membrane planes defined there, right, and you start to pull on it. So we want to compare what happens when you have one bond, when you have eight bonds, when you have 24 bonds, and so on. So this is the system that we build. You can see the planes right there and there, right? And um, it's a little difficult to see, but at the end, you can see this is the way that we're pulling here. This plane is going in this direction. This plane is going in that direction. And it really doesn't matter that they go into the very image because they don't touch uh, in the angle that we put it in. Uh, so with these type of simulations, then we can start to see what happens when you apply forces uh, like what cells would experience, for instance, when they are challenged or in, in development or in an injury, right, in the epithelium, and start to measure what are the forces that are involved in the unbinding of the, these molecules and how they compare when you have two trans bonds, eight trans bonds, 24 trans bonds, uh, with different uh, pulling speeds and so on. Mm -hmm. We do see that uh, there is a decrease in the force. There is an increase in the force required when we go to larger um, uh, systems. And uh, that might be because of the cis interactions that we have uh, between the different proteins. But that is only evident uh, at the slower pulling speed. We also uh, try to see, well, what happens uh, when you stretch, right, and then relax. So one thing that is very interesting about the system is that it's not rigid, really. It actually unbends, and then you have the unbinding. And then you can release the forces and see if it goes back, right? And it acts a little bit like a shock absorber, like a spring, right, that will uh, uh, provide some elasticity um, uh, and right at the interface between cells. Uh, we also look at what happens when you uh, turn off the forces after you have actually done a rupture. So here we stretch, we let them break, right? And then once they are separated, we release. And what you can see is that the bonds actually don't really form again. Uh, there is the curvature is recovered but it's a little more messy than, um, than what we had before. So there might be a threshold, uh, a critical force, right, for um, uh, pulling speed or um, a stretching distance, right, at which you can recover very easily from um, these uh, uh, stretching events. Uh, the RSD indicates that we are going, uh, uh, we're recovering part of the structure, right, but, <clears throat> um, uh, what is also interesting is that this curvature of the italian seems to be something intrinsic to the molecule, not something that just happened in, uh, in the crystal uh, structure. Uh, so for this part of the talk, uh, we do see a difference uh, on how you pull these molecules, and we also see a difference when you pull not one, but many of the molecules together. And um, we are looking at how the stretch system can actually recover and go back to reform this adhesion. Uh, <coughs> now, what is next? Of course, the cadenes have the extracellular domains, right? But they also have a transmembrane domain that is somewhere here, and a cytoplasmic domain that is here in green that binds the catenins and eventually <coughs> binds actin. 
So that is the next system that we're going to build to mm -hmm. see what happens when you pull here and something happens there for signaling uh, and uh, the strengthening of the cytoskeleton. Um, so how much more time do we have? Five minutes. So in five minutes, this is one of the breaks that we have in the lab, right? But in five minutes, I will tell you uh, that we, the Calarian family actually is very large, uh, so we don't have only the classical Calarians, we also have the non-classical Calarians and the classical Calarians. And all of them are defined by this and this. Uh, we have worked a lot on protonin 50 and Calarian 33, which are the molecules essential for your hearing. Uh, without protonin 15 and Calarian 33, you cannot hear. But I will not uh, talk about uh, that today. Uh, rather, I will focus on a new project that we had, which is Protein 19, a protein that is involved on how your neurons connect to each other. <coughs> so Protein 19 is uh, different than the classical terrains. Uh, classical terrains have five repeats, and Protein 19 has six repeats, a transmembrane domain and a cytoplasmic domain. And this is what we knew about Protein 19 when we started. Um, it has this structure, and there are many mutations, missense mutations, that actually cause epilepsy. And the thought was that these mutations were somehow doing, uh, uh, interfering with the function of the protein, but we didn't even know exactly what the function of the protein was. So a um, uh, collaborator, uh, James Jontes, and a uh, <coughs> grad student, Sharon Cooper, actually found out that this uh, protein is expressing subsets of neurons, and the neurons that express the protein that are labeled here in uh, white actually uh, form these columns. So they kind of tend to cluster together to form um, structures that are absent when you have a knockout fish that doesn't have that protein. So it seems that this protein is helping the nervous system and the neurons to stick to each other, right? To form structures that lead to circuits that lead to the development of the brain. And uh, that is uh, a little bit in agreement with what had been uh, predicted many <coughs> years ago, that uh, neurons have to have some way to recognize other neurons, right? To see if they want to bind to them, to adhere to them, right? To form a circuit or um, uh, actually uh, code some sort of way to recognize themselves so they wouldn't form synapses with themselves and then uh, have uh, a short bit. Um, so uh, it is believed that these uh, protocadrains actually are like a barcode that defines what neuron you have. So if you have a subset of these clustered protocadrains or the other protocadrains, then you have your identity, right? And then if you find another piece of membrane that has the same type of cadence on the surface, then you will know that you are touching yourself, right? So you shouldn't form a synapse, right? But if you have a different set, subset of cadence, then you can form a synapse with the, with the name, right? So uh, we decided to try to test whether uh, this protein 19 was really negating adhesion, and for that we did binding assays in which we had the six uh, repeats of protein 19 um, uh, with uh, fused with an FC domain. This FC domain binds to beads that then will aggregate if the molecule is negating adhesion or will not aggregate if they are not negating adhesion. And what you can see is that with calcium, we have adhesion here. Without calcium, we don't have adhesion. Here are the beads forming clumps, right, because the extracellular domains are interacting with each other. Now, we didn't know how they were interacting with each other, and we also knew that it was different than what we had uh, seen for the classical terrains. So I told you that the classical terrains interact with the dip, with PC1, and the classical terrains form this huge aggregate while our protein and team was not that good at forming adhesion. So we knew that the mechanism was it. Now, to make a long story short, I'm going to skip a few things. Sharon actually saw the structure of what we call the minimally ad adhesive unit. So she found that EC1 to EC4 was required to form the adhesive bond, right? And then we could map all the mutations that actually cause epilepsy and identify some mutations 
that uh, actually were interfering with the folding of the protein, some mutations that we didn't know what they were doing, and some mutations that actually were uh, impairing calcium binding. Uh, when we look at the crystal structure and, and the lattice, what we saw is that actually this protein forms an anti parasite <coughs> interface. So now it's not an EC1 and EC1 anymore, but more like an EC1 to EC4 uh, interface that is shown here. And some of the mutations actually that cause epilepsy map right at the interface between the two proteins. So Sharon did uh, look at these mutations, and some of the ones that we didn't know what they were doing were right at the interface between the two proteins. So she did some mutations and showed that while the wild type can form aggregates, these mutations impair the binding between the two proteins. And we think that that is what leads to disease, right? So if you cannot form the adhesive bond, then the neurons cannot identify the partners that cannot form the right circuits, and that somehow leads to uh, a diversity phenotype. So that is our model of how uh, protein and gene forms. This is a new mechanism that is also used, uh, that we call the forearm uh, handshake, right? That is used by um, several uh, different protocolarian systems out that at the same time as we were um, uh, publishing this result, other groups published very similar structures of other uh, cluster protocolarians that are involved in this uh, adhesion uh, um, recognition. Uh, uh, so I will not go uh, uh, much more on this, just show you some of the simulations that we're now doing of unbinding this, um, these proteins to see the mechanics and how the mechanics may help in the selectivity. And then just um, kind of skip this part and go directly. Um, we also work in King, but this is a whole another talk, right? Um, that I can give you, invite me to give a talk, right? Um, that uh, right now we have over all those slides, so let me just skip um, and see. You see, I have too many slides here. And I just want to go. See, that was too much. Let's go here to the end and uh, show you a little bit. This is Ohio State. Uh, my lab is somewhere here. It's a huge university. The most important building uh, in Ohio State is the stadium. Uh, 110,000 people can fit there. And I think we did Michigan last time we played, right? And I have two Michigan people there. <laughs> Um, and that's the group uh, throughout the years. Um, it's a large group, it's a lot of fun, um, and we follow the uh, examples that Yusan and uh, Tao set for us uh, to have uh, a nice uh, um, uh, environment and also to do great science uh, together. So, with that, I also want to finalize by saying that all our images are made on, with DMD. All our simulations <coughs> are done with DMD. I, uh, uh, my students hide uh, on the back when they use Pymol because they know I get super upset <laughs> <laughs> and that they have to use DMD. I, cannot, I don't allow them to use any other software. Right? Um, so, and that has been uh, tremendously helpful for us and for the development of our uh, research program. Thank you and thank you, Klaus. Time, but we have left you with a few minutes for questions. So, anybody questions here? Maybe I can start it. Mm -hmm. I, the picture that you said to the uh, organization that was in the optical place. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you show me those optical sure. dominance yeah. columns? So, so like left or right eye, No, so left, uh, what happens is that you have the crossing of the nerves, right? And then they innervate the optic section. And within the optic section, you have these columns that form, right? And those come presumably from different parts of the retina, but we don't know. Where in the picture are the neurons? Where are the neurons? So, those are the, the white. Uh, Things are the cells that are <coughs> the the under the promoter of the right? So that's what forms. 
And you can see kind of the branches, right, the axons and so on, and that's what forms the, col the collection of those. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's okay. very interesting that you did it. I love it, the feathering part. And I was really surprised to see that you don't have much higher courses than you have like a chain of feathering versus just one. My question was, is the interface to contact the house independent of the world? Or it seems that it's not, right? So, um, so there are two parts to your question. One is uh, that the fourth lesson looked that much bigger. But what we're showing there is the force normalized by the number of uh, uh, okay, so the total force, right? The total force of course oh, okay. is larger, right? But then what we're trying to compare is a single trans, trans bond, right? Does it get stronger because of the other ones that are there or not? Right? And for that what we do is that we compare the total force, but then we divide it by the by the uh, different things. And then uh, the, the calcium dependency, I think it has two different aspects to it, and I'll show this one here. Um, one is that without calcium, the molecule is just dropping, right? So then it may not be exposed to engage with the other uh, at the end. But the other one that we discovered in one of the simulations that we did with Klaus is that this trick that that is pointing out, when calcium is not there, actually it flips back and forth. So it's the less available for binding uh, and the binding. Mm -hmm. yeah, are there any other questions? There's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So with our next speaker, Ilya, we're going to return to one of Klaus's earliest projects. Uh, actually, uh, Klaus and I even worked on this together and and that's on the magnetic sense, the vibratory birds. And we are at that time looking at how a magnetic field really influences what is the display of the reverse magnetic field. It influences radical lives. And when we solve parts of the problem, and then it would like for a while, and then new information would come in, new experiments, new students would be put on to it. So I. Ilya was, I think, <coughs> say exactly what he did. Thank you, Zan. And uh, I would like to start by expressing my deepest gratitude for being here today. It's uh, actually, a, I really tried hard this morning to find in all the languages that I know the right words to express. That's uh, so great to have a second time here. Thank you for coming. And it's uh, better. And thank you very much for that. So, uh, in this presentation, I would like to basically to, uh, show you how it came that I started working with Klaus, what it meant for me to work with Klaus, what we did together with Klaus. So, I will try actually to speak as little as possible about my you know, about recent achievements after a little bit. And, uh, well, um, I would also like to say that I would like to try to explain as little as possible, and I will try to state as many things as possible. So that's one of the things I, you know, I learned from you. The other thing is, I would like to start with a conclusion. So I would like to say that, um, well, you know, it's, uh, it was so great to work with Klaus. I learned so many different things from him. I mean, I learned how to write papers that will be cited in the course. I learned, you know, how to write proposals, how to make figures, animations. Well, I learned how the Mercedes is back, actually, yes. yes. I learned how to do when you go to social bar. One thing that I unfortunately never mastered is actually to uh, control my emotions. So in the case if I suddenly start laughing hysterically or burst into tears, I beg you about forgiveness. But you know that's um, I mean, a very uh, very difficult uh, presentation for me to give. Okay, well my story actually started back in 2004 when I just uh, well defended my uh, diploma thesis, and at that point I was working on Atomic clusters. And well, as you can see, I defined that on the 1st of November, a week later, I became a PhD student at the newly founded Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. The main problem was that I neither had a topic or a supervisor. You know, some students would find it so great because you know, you have someone paying you money, and you, know, you actually don't really need to manage it. But well, somehow I felt a little bit awkward because you know, this was not really what, uh, what I wanted uh, you know, uh, to do. So, and then I started uh, talking to you know, different scientists that were hired at this institute. 
And the problem is that, uh, sadly, at none of the uh, well, newly appointed fellows that were interdisciplinary enough for me. So I, I really couldn't feel myself like doing one of those topics. And I mean, I was really at the point that I didn't really know what to do. And then I, I went to talk with my uh, diploma thesis advisor, who actually also was my official uh, PhD advisor, Paul Brenner. And this is more or less exactly what he said. So, Ilya, don't worry. I know, I know what to do. I know somebody that will, will come soon to Frankfurt and he will be an young fellow at our FES. Well, you need to meet this person. His name is Paul Schuh. And this is actually how I first time learned about Paul Schuh. And, uh, well, it took not exactly, you know, so little time. It's actually the first time I asked, but I do remember the date quite exactly. So this was uh, over the third, and uh, in the morning I get a call, call from uh, Paul Greiner. They you know, you need to be at the Institute of Analysis. They could literally, I mean, you just go. And the problem was, I just came from Argentina, and I really had like a terrible cold. Like, I mean, I was like, you know, 40 something, you know, with fever, like in my bed, I mean, I barely could move. But I mean, yeah, surely, I mean, you know, I really wanted to meet Klaus, and I came. And I remember we spent about half a day together with Zen and Klaus sitting in one of the uh, courtyards. And this is actually when Klaus uh, basically. Uh, Explain to me what is computational biophysics, and this is actually my school. I mean, you know, it's, I, I knew this is exactly what I want to do. This is exactly the person I would like to work with, and I mean, that's, that's basically you know the beginning of my my story. This class. So, but uh, well, I also would like actually to add to this introduction actually a joke. But uh, I, I remember this joke, and this uh, I mean, also kind of you know tells a little bit about Klaus's personality. So because after after this meeting, so uh, well. Uh, but well, anyone it was a bit more difficult to get hold of him because you know, he was traveling a lot and he was you know well, here and there. So I tried to trace him, you know, all over Germany, Europe, and well, basically just follow him. But then I knew that he would be you know somewhere in Europe. I mean, I knew that I need to go there and to, to talk to this person because I mean, really, you know, like just uh, a brief conversation, like half an hour conversation with Klaus, motivated me for the next half a year of my PhD, and I knew exactly what to do, and you know that that was sufficient. Sometimes we might be you know, in good places, like you know, like business launch at the Frankfurt Airport. Sometimes the locations are a bit more awkward, like for those of you who know what Frankfurt Hauptbahnhof is. Well, um, you know, well, once you went to Pizzeria, just next to Frankfurt Hauptbahnhof, there and, yeah, so I mean, it was a great discussion with Claude, but yes, well, again, those of you who know what this area is, well, then, then you, know, you understand what I mean, what I mean. Sometimes you get met at our institute, and it's, well, shortly after actually we started working on the reception. So, uh, well, we were actually discussing things at, at my office, and then the gentleman, Christoph von the Mark Martinburg, passed uh, by, so he saw Klaus in, in the open door. And, well, this is actually a dialogue that they had, more or less exactly, because I, I do remember this very well. So, well, Christoph was saying, well, what are you doing here? Well, you know, so nice, <coughs> so nice, well, nice to see you. And then Klaus would be thinking this is a very typical man, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't really say that, hello, hello. And, uh, you, know, you know, I'm here, tell her, here, and you know, I have a student here. Well, seriously, how come? And then Klaus told the story, basically, that, you know, well, Ryan really insisted that, you know, I work with this, with this chap, and, you know, he's Russian, and in fact, this is actually the third idiot to come work with me. So, well, the experience from the first two didn't, wasn't really so positive. So the first one really started to kill me. Well, and the second one was also, you know, like, uh, well, it wasn't so good. And well, basically, what Paul said, and, you know, I promised them that I would never work with a Russian if his name would be Union. <laughs> so, well, but then, you know, when Reiner asked him, so, you know, there was this problem because, you know, he couldn't really refuse. And, and then he saw that I, I don't spell my name the way as Ilya 1 and 2 does. So I'm. <laughs> Very grateful that you know, you know, this is actually put the end of you know, all of my story as well, but you know, the initial conditions are important and so <laughs> alright. So uh, let me now get to the uh, scientific part and well as you uh, well as you uh, from the introduction and from the also from, uh, from the extract well, I will be talking about uh, this topic that Klaus uh, started many years ago. So quantum biology of computer perception. So at some point, they actually were writing this review uh, paper with, with, uh, with Klaus and Dr. Greiner. And actually, I'm very proud of this paper because this is my only German publication. So, and, uh, well, and then I tried to trace back, you know, what is actually the first machine that uh, alien uh, uh, birds have a uh, magnetic compass. So, and actually, I decided to go to the hardcore way. I went to the library, you know, like a red, real library. And I started looking at different books, you know, like, and it was actually quite an experience, and I uh, managed to backtrace the first mentioning of all the hypothesis uh, was around the middle of the 19th century. So basically at this point, it was uh, speculated, suggested, 
the thunderous library they utilize magnetic fields for quantum navigation. Well, it took some years actually to prove it scientifically, and well, this, here you see an experimental setup, the way I see it. Well, that actually first demonstrated that birds have this magnetic sense. So here you see a bird that is put inside of a cage that is about 40 centimeters in diameter. And the interior of the cage is covered with a paper that will be sensitive to scratches. So now what you do is like, you put a, well, one bird in a cage, and then you just uh, let it uh, stay there for like an hour. Then you take this paper, it usually looks much more messy than what you actually see in this in, in the slide. And then you repeat this experiment 1,000 times. Then you have the statistics, and then you can basically say, yeah, it seems that this uh, encaged burst would like to jump in a certain direction. So, and this is basically, you know, some, you know, some averaging some results of what you will get. But now, since this is in laboratory, you, you can control things, and you can, for instance, uh, put this cage uh, in a screened environment and apply the artificial magnetic field. And then you see the birds start jumping in a different direction. And this is basically, well, I mean, this, uh, the first experiment to show that birds seem to uh, feel this very deep magnetic field and about uh, somehow uh, use it. So, well, there were many, many papers published on the topic that showed that this magnetic compass has a lot of really weird properties. Like, one of the such properties is, for instance, that apparently it requires light to be, to be accurate. And not just light, it seems to be its blue and green light that is important. While if the doors are exposed red and yellow, why, I mean, they'll just, you know, hope uh, random. So, I don't really have the time to talk about all the relevant experiments here, just actually want to mention this, one, this slide. And, uh, well, this uh, is definitely a large scale problem that, well, basically brings us all the way from behavioral biology to the scale of helicons, as you'll hear in a moment. And in order to understand how it works, actually, you, you need to not at least understand how things operate on different levels. So, and, well, definitely the problem, problem is far from being trivial. And uh, well, this is more or less my understanding after of the problem, you know, when I, when I started, uh, you know, working in this field, because, yeah, <laughs> not my comment that much, much for that. So, why did I mention electrons? So, electrons have this really important and remarkable property called the spin. So, which basically uh, allows them to uh, uh, move in a very specific uh, manner in a magnetic field. So, uh, Basically, I mean, if, if I would consider an, you know, an, an atom as an apparent electron, I mean, this, that would be a characteristic frequency, like larger frequency, at which that uh, an electron would process. Very similar situation will happen also in radicals, molecules that have an apparent electron. I mean, may, maybe the, the main difference uh, here is that you know, there would be a, a, some internal magnetic fields that also have to be taken into account to describe this uh, electron dynamics more precisely. But now, uh, if you consider a pair of such radicals, well, then we are talking about a radical pair. And a radical pair, according to quantum mechanics, can be imagined in two uh, different spin states. A single state, a triple state, depending on how these spins are oriented. And this is basically what, uh, what brings me to the foundation of the so-called chemical compass that uh, was originally proposed by Klaus. So if you have a pair of such radicals, so uh, depending on the spin state, is a single or triple state, well, you can expect uh, this radical strategy <coughs> and form different chemical products. And the important is that the external magnetic field can actually change the equilibrium in the singlet and the triplet space. And, uh, well, uh, in this way, so this chemical compass can actually respond to fields and sometimes very deep magnetic fields, like earth, uh, earth magnetic field. So, short after the, actually this magnetic sense in birth was discovered, so th this paper uh, was uh, published by, by uh, Klaus, who basically uh, proposed an explanation how this works. And, well, to my opinion, this is, this is really a great paper, and, you know, that's, you know, actually everybody in the magnetic perception community knows that, and everybody admits that, uh, well, only physicists can actually understand that, right? I mean, all the behavioral biologists would say, okay, well, we, we kind of can maybe read the first sentence of that, but then that's more or less it. So, but, uh, you know, the, the genius of Paul was so that actually he put all the ideas already back then in 78 in this article, and, well, I mean, they, they have been now discussed, you know, more and more, and many of them actually turn out to be uh, true, so I'm more than convinced that you know, this, is, this is the right thing. So, so here basically I, uh, I summarize uh, uh, a way how, uh, how possibly one could imagine a radical pair to be created. And so in this case, we are talking about some, uh, uh, some light excitation and electron transfer. So I will be talking about that in a moment in more detail, so maybe I will just uh, jump to the next slide. So, well, also in this, uh, in this paper, Klaus uh, uh, show, shows this, uh, this plot here, basically, when studied a specific radical pair in solution, so, uh, well, it was possible to uh, predict 
how a fluorescent symbol would behave in a light magnetic field. And remarkably, the theoretical equation was, you know, explaining perfectly well what was seen in the experiment. You know, this line and the, and the dots are great. I mean, the agreement is great, right? And well, now I want to show you two slides. Actually, these are original slides from Klaus. And uh, well, I, uh, actually, I, I do have a couple of presentations from him that, uh, well, sometimes he shares those, sometimes actually I have to give it in one of those occasions. So in connection with this paper, actually, we'd like to uh, you know, show well, two things. One is that, uh, well, you know, this statement that you, know, you basically want to put forward that you know, this is a very, very important, you know, application you know, for biologists. But then there was a story that actually he always liked to tell about this specific paper. Because uh, he liked to say that when he actually was proposing this mechanism, he was so excited that the first uh, journal to send the work was science. And uh, so when he did that, so this was uh, this information that actually what he received as a response from the reviewer. Basically saying that, you know, a less bold scientist would just, you know, just throw this away. And uh, so that kind of, uh, to me, showed that, well, you know, this, uh, this suggestion, this, you know, this discovery was, was really uh, uh, much earlier than, you know, what people could actually appreciate from this kind of And, uh, well, I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's just how I, how I understand it, how I feel. So, well, then also uh, about the same time, so that there were, uh, uh, you know, some papers published that basically demonstrated that now if you consider uh, the spherical pairs in the crystal, so you could uh, basically study the uh, fluorescent signal as a function of the orientation of magnetic field and actually obtain a nice sinusoidal profile that basically proves the concept of a chemical compass. So, years later, Klaus uh, will make another uh, revolutionary prediction in the field, basically to suggest a, a molecule that would cause these uh, radical pairs and pro possibly be responsible for magnetic sensing in birds. So, I'm talking about this article from Sal, who is a student of Birds So, basically, this, in this work, he proposed that there, this protein cryptochrome may be the right molecule to uh, co uh, co uh, deliver the, the compass sense to the, the bird. And uh, at this point, I mean, well, you know, this was merely a suggestion. I mean, well, actually, if you read the paper, you will see that, you know, they just, you know, a few sentences uh, sort of uh, suggesting that. So there was no real explanation of it. It was stated. But uh, well, now, actually, uh, you know, this paper is so exciting. I mean, there are so many, actually, proofs, indirect uh, proofs that, I mean, this actually really may be the right, uh, the right uh, 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 molecule. So also, that paper, so Klaus uh, actually uh, used a uh, as I call two model of cryptochrome, basically to demonstrate that this protein could have very uh, uh, significant magnetic field effects. And uh, well, this is uh, actually the first paper that I got from him when, when we first met in, uh, in, uh, 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 in uh, 2005. So I mean, he gave this paper, and I probably actually have to go back to November, I still have it with all the notes, and you know, it's a little bit, you know, well, messed up by now, but I, I don't remember how he was actually explaining here all, all this plots and what, what, what they mean. So, cryptocurrency signaling uh, is involving uh, a light excitation and an electron transfer. So, very similar to the diagrams that, uh, that I showed before. And the important uh, key player here is this molecule flame that is uh, non covalently bound inside of the protein. So, once F of the flame gets, uh, gets uh, excited by light, so there is an electron transfer from the cryptophane to the flame that leads to the formation of a radical pair. So, very important is the cryptogram. Uh, seem to be found in the outer segment of the water receptor cells. And this is important because, well, then actually we can really imagine constructing uh, a, a nice uh, visual magnetic compass. And, well, you remember that uh, light seems to be important for activating the magnetic sense. So, well, I would be a natural uh, place to look for these molecules to appear. Well, this uh, the figure actually from our paper from 2012, and this actually is their experimental measurement a year later, where basically a cryptochrome was uh, uh, well, not exactly as a location as uh, well, we could So, well, uh, when I, uh, I, I started working on this project, first, uh, I mean, of course, I wanted to, to understand you know, all the steam chemistry and well, how the radical pairs interact with magnetic fields, but uh, also we really wanted to look, kind of push the boundaries. We really wanted to see that, okay, if this is cryptochrome, <coughs> is it possible actually, actually to study this whole cryptochrome and actually to uh, to demonstrate that well, there can be or cannot be a significant magnetic field response. And uh, so, well, we try to combine all possible techniques and methods that we can enhance, and um, basically, both to study the you know, classical motion of atoms, but also look at some quantum mechanical uh, transformations. 
So I'm going to show you some uh, more specific results now. And uh, so in, in the in what I'm going to uh, talk here now, I will be talking about the structure of a cryptogram protein from plant. Unfortunately, we don't really have a structure, a crystal structure of eight of the bird cryptograms. So, well, here we, we need to imagine that, okay, you know, there may be some analogies, and well, we did some work by uh, looking at this plant cryptogram. And I do believe this is a bit, uh, well, relatively relevant. Well, the first thing is the light excitation. So it's possible to using some quantum chemistry methods to describe the process quite precisely. So you saw well, this, uh, this bluish blob coming from the, uh, from, from the left. I mean, this was a blue light photon that was exciting the, uh, the light. And well, this is your, how the electronic density would uh, prevent itself after the light excitation. Well, then again, using some quantum mechanical methods, we can actually uh, demonstrate that almost immediately after this, uh, this light excitation occurred, you can see here on this energy diagram, there is a very fast electron transfer from the cryptophane to the plane. The least the formation of this, uh, of this radical pair that, uh, that I uh, announced before. Well, the entire photoactivation reaction of cryptochrome is a little bit more complex and requires a little bit you know, more steps. So, well, here this is you know, a, a summary of the figure, and uh, well, we, we try to describe all of them very carefully using the approaches that I, uh, that I mentioned before. I don't have that, unfortunately, the time to talk about all that in detail, and I believe, well, maybe not all of you will be interested in that, but yeah, just, I would say that, you know, this is how, how it is, and I, I, I firmly believe this is, yeah, this is actually the right activation diagram, at least for, for the cryptogram this side. So, uh, I mean, also there is, you know, some, some experimental support, of course, where it is possible to measure all these kinds in space by using transient absorption spectroscopy. And uh, uh, so, in addition to that, we can actually also now model uh, the, all the process indication. So we can use, the, for example, the tight binding uh, approach in order to demonstrate how an electron will be jumping from one of the cryptophane residues to another. And uh, I would like to show you a, a movie, so basically kind of to illustrate like, what, uh, what our calculation showed. So that uh, you see here this uh, blue-red uh, uh, surface. So this represents an, uh, a missing electron. It actually represents a radical. Uh, and then when I uh, let uh, the system evolve dynamically, you see that well, this, uh, uh, this radical starts evolving towards other, uh, other cryptophane residues in cryptochrome, and after a certain time, so it actually will emerge uh, on, on one of the cryptophanes here. <coughs> so, so I believe this was actually very, very, uh, very important uh, in my last forward, because actually they really could, uh, could describe this dynamic very precisely and well, see you know, how this radical pairs interconnect inside, uh, inside the uh, property. So, uh, of course, I mean, if you do computations, we do have the possibility to uh, well, basically to observe all, this, all the details, which would be otherwise quite difficult using not conventional <coughs> experimental techniques. So, for instance, it is possible to measure the kinetics of, of the different electron transfer rates. And so, well, we do so in using the simple kinetic model, and uh, well, uh, the, the agreement was fine. Also, you are able to demonstrate actually that uh, so the environment seems to be playing a really crucial role in the case of electron transfer in cryptochrome. So when we studied uh, cryptochrome in the solvent, so we saw that by every hop of electron from one cryptophane to another, the energy of the corresponding radical pair was steadily increasing. I mean, you, you can quite understand that. You know, well, the lower the better, right? But if I would turn off the interaction of the protein with the solvent, you see completely different behavior. So, so this actually really allowed us to understand the mechanism. So what is actually going on in this problem? So, well, I will quickly skip this slide and just go to that one. So, then, uh, so here I basically I would like to summarize. So the way how most of the people will understand how cryptochrome uh, gets, uh, gets actually. This is a figure from, actually from my first paper of this class. So, well, if you, if you, if you pay attention to this, your references, I mean, they were not technological at all. But actually, I started showing you probably some of the, of our, uh, you know, late, latest results, and actually here I get back to our first uh, paper, where we basically summarized this reaction. At this time, we didn't really know all these kinetic rates, all the different constants, <coughs> we just assumed them. So we just said, okay, well, this seems to be reasonable, and this is probably how it should be. And uh, then, so we, we studied this reaction scheme, we also predicted what can be the magnetic field effect in this in this uh, cryptochrome. And well, this was done using some uh, some uh, some quantum mechanics and well, solving some stochastic new equations. Well, I don't really want to go in, in, in explaining these formulas. I just more or less just here yeah, just you know, to scare some of you and uh, well, you know, also to show that okay, well, actually, well, we we were actually using some you know some hardcore uh, theory you know to predict this uh, this nice uh, results. So I'll get to the results. 
And uh, so what we what actually did in this in this first paper, so we, we showed that so well now if you study the activation probability of cryptochrome as a function of the direction of the magnetic field, you can see some uh, some uh, some difference. So you, you can actually see that well this is you know a rather abstract figure, but it kind of uh, is supposed to show that uh, you know if uh, if a bird would be turning it, its head right or left up and down, so then it would actually impact the influence the probability of activating cryptochrome probabilities inside, of, inside the eye. And um, I remember actually, so th this was a meeting next to Hauptmann from Hauptmann in Germany, when we were about to finalize this, this article, and Klaus told me at that moment, he said, you know, William, let's do this and that, and then you know, we submit this article, and believe me, this will be your most cited article ever. And just uh, like about a week ago, actually, this became my most cited, cited article. So, so, I mean, yes. Uh, all right, so uh, I think that my, my time is uh, probably running out, and I would like to give some uh, time for questions as well. So I actually will keep uh, this part, and I just go to the, to the last uh, slide of my presentation. So I would like to thank Klaus. And well, this is a quote from him, actually, that I, I have written down in 2012, because uh, I, I thought this was, was really inspiring. And, you know, he, I mean, he, he proposed you know, this, this whole uh, mechanism. You know, this, this, he basically, he, uh, he boomed this area of magnetic perception from, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, the power of his source. And, um, well, then he goes ahead and conceded for one day. Well, you cannot say that. But, um, also, I would like to say, I mean, these are different snapshots, you know, that, you know, that are in, in my memory, that, well, how I remember clouds, and, you know, some of this, uh, weapon. Oh. Very nice occasions. And so, I mean, um, one of the things which I, um, I mean, I will always remember, is actually how he was treating people. I mean, some people said that, but I mean, he actually, in the case of my family, I mean, he, uh, he was really always there. So not only for me, he was actually always there for my wife. And so now when, uh, when I'm kind of, you know, get back from work, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm confused, and I mean, I'm angry with, you know, some colleagues. I mean, well, the first person to talk to would be, of course, my wife. And the first thing she would always say is, you yeah, didn't think would cause of doing this situation. And then he goes, and so that I would like to, Thank you for your attention. Now, when Klaus would come home from work, he'd also talk to his wife. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> Talking to your wife. Right. So, uh, are there any comments? Questions about this? But are the cryptocurrencies specifically oriented in the retina so that they align with? Uh, a direction which the bird knows about. Well, uh, you know, of course, we don't really know uh, exactly how they, uh, these problems are, you know, attached to the retina, so we, we know that they are there. But also, in, in our paper, where we predicted the location of the of, of cryptograms, so we studied this, uh, this how the effect of disorder a problem would have in order to deliver a comment. So, I mean, this is based on, you know, on some, uh, some properties of this radical pairs and so on. And basically, the conclusion was that, so if you, if you, uh, well, if you describe cryptogram as a rigid body, that uh, requires three angles uh, you know, to describe this orientation. You can forget about two of them completely, and one of them should be uh, somewhat constrained. So, I mean, you don't really need uh, the problems to be you know, perfectly aligned. I mean, they, I mean, there is, you know, quite room, you know, for some disorder. Uh, unfortunately, you don't really have this information uh, yet to tell how that is there. So.
Josh and I have 24 papers to mail. So I would not be anywhere near where I am if I all his input. And really, just going back to you know, what Thomas was saying about trust, how did he look at this ridiculously naive but behind the ears grad student? Just chugging out people all the time, that still happens. And say, I'm going to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars of computer time and go do whatever you want, essentially. Um, but of course, I'm glad you did it. And so I also sat down as I was starting to make my slides and I wanted to pull out some lessons that I learned from class. And you know, I could spend an hour just talking about that. We don't have an hour, so I'm going to hit the most important ones. And I, as I was thinking about the work I did with them, uh, I think one of the most important lessons was sometimes how not to listen to people. And it was not how not to listen to him. I listened to him, but it was how not to listen to the people who would say things like, that system's too big, because we did this a lot. So, you know, when I was in grad school, we did these simulations of uh, satellite tobacco mosaic virus, and it was a monster system, so we got this a lot. Um, but, you know, it turned out to be very productive, and I think during that process, I got uh, a couple of other really important lessons from class. So, the first one was, when we did these simulations the first time, so it's this giant virus, it's packed full of RNA, and it took us months running on a dedicated queue onto the wall, which was this great computer at the time, to do the simulations we wanted to do. And then I'm looking over them, and I notice a problem, that there is this giant void in the middle of the virus at the end of the simulations, because I, hadn't saw, I had not spent enough time equilibrating the water and really getting all that RNA fully solvated, and so it was all junk. And I go cap in hand to Klaus thinking he's going to kill me because of this time we wasted, and he didn't yell, he wasn't upset, he just said, all right, let's get it right and do it again. And that dedication to doing the science right is so important. And was really perfectly uh, everything to do with you. And so uh, then when we went back, Anton and I were the two grad students working on this, we did it right, we did it again, we got simulations that were actually reasonable. And we were so happy with ourselves because we had tamed this unconquerable beast, this monster system, we had simulated it. We go to class and he says, Oh, that's great. So what? So now I want you to use your brains and find 10 things you can learn from these simulations and then come back to me. And so that was really my primer. Yes, user, I see someone laughing in the back about the user brain thing, the brains thing. We got this a lot, it was always really important. But that was really showing me uh, you know, how important it was to think deeply about what you were doing and how it connected to the biology. And so this wasn't the only advice from people that we ignored. We also ignored other things, like those simulations are too long, uh, because we wanted to do protein folding simulations. And so we were doing these simulations on, uh, say, the villain pet piece, uh, which you know, you've seen these uh, videos earlier during this symposium. It worked. Um, but in the process, it, again, Klaus really showed me how much he paid attention to everything and how much attention to detail mattered. Because to get these things working, we were running these simulations and talking to Jim and John about optimizing NAMBI, always running the nightly builds and sending Klaus daily reports about exactly what performance we were getting uh, on this system uh, to make this happen. Uh, but it worked. And then, there are other lessons too, like uh, if Chris Lockhurst can't figure out, then uh, molecular dynamics has no chance. And so I think this is less of a problem now than it was when I was in grad school. But this actually came from one of my favorite systems I worked on uh, with Klaus. And it doesn't uh, maybe get as many citations uh, as some of these other ones, but this was the log domain, which uh, aside from spawning the best puns in article titles that I've ever seen, and there really are a lot of them. Um, it's a really interesting biophysical problem, which is you've got this little light sensor, and there's a plate in here that I'm not showing. And we know that if you hit this thing with blue light, there's a covalent bond that forms between the protein and the flavin, and now the helix way on the other side of the protein falls off. But 
But if you look at the crystal structures of the dark and light state, there's a 22 angstrom alpha carbon RMSD. So you're really getting no help from the crystal structures. But we're able to simulate it, and we're able to see that when you actually watch what's happening, you can find this little glutamine that's interacting with the flavin, and it flips when you form that covalent bond, and pushes the beta sheet away, and you get the alpha helix falling off. Um, and the, the attention to detail uh, that Klaus really got us to go into with this, again, was just so important. And even when it wasn't the highest profile system that we were looking at, we could still get a huge amount out of it. So there are also plenty of, there are a lot of other lessons also uh, that I got from class. These are the first few on the list of about 500. Um, and I, I see myself channeling all of these things now that I'm running the lab all the time and how I interact with people, with colleagues and with trainees. And so this first one I think is actually one of the very most important ones. And it's very important to me that I'm saying treat your colleagues with kindness, not just treat them as human beings, because just treating them as human beings isn't enough. Klaus was always gracious and generous um, and really helped people to do good work and to be balanced. And so, you know, I think the best example of this that uh, I had with him was when I was in grad school, um, my mother-in-law was dying of cancer. And I asked Klaus if I could start spending some time with my wife going up to Michigan and spending a week there and coming back and working. And he instead basically told me, no, just go spend a couple months in Michigan. And, you know, he knew I would work remotely, but he just told me to go be with the family. Sorry. Um, and so now, now that I'm a grad student in a similar position, it's easy to make the right decision. And I'm really glad I have these lessons. And you know, these other things, I'm not going to necessarily spend every bullet point, spend time on every bullet point, but really, um, this one's important, I think, and I mean that both in terms of research ethics and in terms of always doing the very best that you can. Klaus would always do his best. He would talk down the sort of vengeful instincts that would sometimes come up when I was dealing with a bad review or a competitor or something like that, and make sure we always focused on doing well. Um, and this one, this has always really helped me. Clarity is so important. You've heard this in says so many different ways in terms of clarity of thought and of understanding, clarity of explanation uh, to make sure that people are really getting what you want them to out of something. Um, and uh, the clarity of presentation, also making sure all your figures were right, they didn't have yellow in them, making sure that you used the word <laughs> this properly. <laughs> Every generation had that lecture, I think. At least an hour in group meetings. And, and I knew I was really in trouble on this point. Uh, but once in a while, I would write something. And after we went through a couple of revisions of us, Klaus still wasn't happy with it. And he would actually pull me into his office and make me sit there as he rewrote it. With, you know, he would do the roaming pack type. And so you, you would go through this and never want this to happen again. Um, but <laughs> I got so much out of the discussions that happened as a result of this. Um, and there's one more lesson. Uh, I'm surprised I haven't heard it during the symposium, but one of the fun things I really think sums up how we looked at science, uh, never start a project that you can't win the Nobel Prize for. You like to say it. And that doesn't mean that you're doing it to win the Nobel Prize. And it doesn't mean that you expect to win the Nobel Prize. What it means is that you think big, and you find a project that's going to have an impact and matter, and not just be some little thing that sits in a dusty corner of a journal and doesn't do anything for anyone. So talk a little bit about science now with whatever time I have and Sam, well, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time, but stop me when I'm you know hitting my limits. But... Okay, so that's perfect. Yeah. So um I for a minute I was reading my five minutes now and I didn't think I So my lab now uh, is a hybrid experimental and computational lab. And what we're trying to do is take Klaus's vision, things like there's no label physics in nature, and really bring that to bacterial systems biology. We want to understand how bacteria work uh, to the point where we can really model them and predict their behavior. And 
Uh, to give you an idea of why it's so important to understand how bacteria behave, I want to start from a very simple example that everyone knows about, but that really makes us think that these things are not nearly as sophisticated as they are. And so this is the lab repressor uh, system. And so the way we learned about the lab repressor, this great hydrogen atom of gene regulation, were some experiments done by Jacob and Manu. What they did was they took a culture uh, of E. coli, and they grew them in a mixture of glucose and lactose as carbon sources. And so what they would see if you monitor the growth is the cells would grow at a constant rate on the glucose until they ran out of glucose. And then there was a pause, and then they would start eating the lactose, and they would grow at some different rate. And that little pause right here is what won <laughs> know the Nobel Prize, because they understood what it meant. It meant that the bacteria were not making the genes they needed to eat lactose until the right time, until there was no glucose around which they preferred, and there was lactose around. So this um, idea is, uh, of bacteria just responding directly to their surroundings turns out to be insufficient uh, to really understand how they behave. And to give an example of why it's insufficient, uh, I want to tell you about an experiment that was done in the lab with my postdoc advisor right before I joined. So it starts out very similarly. You take E. coli, a culture E. coli growing at room temperature, and you raise their temperature to 37 Celsius, human body temperature, and you watch their gene expression. And what do you see? Uh, what you see is uh, there's a small heat shock response, and you expect this because you raise the temperature. But they induce an acid stress response. They shut down their aerobic metabolism, and they turn on genes that help resist bile salts. This makes no sense in the framework of the lab repressor, uh, where cells are responding directly to whatever it is they're dealing with in their environment. But it makes perfect sense in the ecological context of E. coli. This is a gut microbe. And it spends its evolutionary history cycling in and out of mammalian digestive tracts. So in that context, what does it mean when the temperature rises to 37 Celsius? It means you've just been eating. And you've got seconds to minutes because before there's going to be no oxygen, a bunch of acid, and if you survive that, then there are going to be a bunch of bile salts when you end up in the intestine. So we call this uh, anticipatory regulation. Uh, it turns out to be a very uh, frequently occurring uh, paradigm in bacterial regulatory networks and other microbial regulatory networks, and we have to understand this and all the linkages in it and what it means for their fitness under different conditions uh, to really be able to model how these organisms behave. And another reason that um, understanding when bacteria turn on what is so important to things like uh, dealing with virulence, developing antibiotics, um, comes from some data that we got from gene knockout studies. And so um, the, a set of experiments that, that we and others had done and then we pulled together um, was to take uh, fitness data from knockouts of single genes drawn across, across 144 different conditions, different antibiotics, ethanol, pH stresses, you name it and then look at uh, what the, the fitness effects were, whether the cell grew better or worse with different genes knocked out. And so I've got here a plot. This is the log two of the number of significant fitness differences uh, occurring uh, for different null mutations uh, for each condition. Uh, here means there were no uh, null mutations that made a difference. All the other ones, the um, blue points are null mutations that helped the bacteria under that condition, and the red points are mutations that hurt the bacteria. And really the key is under all of the six of these, or sorry, you know, all the six of these conditions, there's at least one knockout that helps the cells grow better. And in general, it tends to be a lot. It averages something like 20 uh, beneficial null mutations. And so because to a first approximation, null mutations like them just completely shutting down expression of a gene, this again shows us how much the regulation matters. So um, we want them to understand bacterial regulatory networks. We want to be able to go from the atomistic to uh, the network scale and figure out um, what the molecular mechanisms are driving their gene expression and what the connection is between those expression patterns uh, to fitness. And so that's going to let us uh, predict behavior, uh, design combinations of stimuli to be <coughs> bacteria like that, make them more sensitive to antibiotics by triggering a maladaptive response, uh, or to engineer uh, bacteria to do specific things um, that we want for them. 
And so I want to tell you with the rest of the time I have today uh, about how we're trying to answer three kindergarten questions named in honor of Klaus, because his lab wasn't a kindergarten, so it's very, very important that we all knew. But mine is, so we ask these questions. And so, so the simple questions are, what are all the proteins in the cell doing, which turns out to be surprisingly hard? Um, when are all the different genes expressed? And how do cells make decisions about what genes to express when? And so this first question, what do all cellular proteins do, is one of these uh, great examples where we can pull modeling and experiment together uh, to uh, answer something really profound. Uh, so we want to, uh, if we want to know how cellular behavior works, we of course have to understand what all the proteins do in all of the organisms that we care about. And this is something of a problem. What I'm showing here, this is a graph just showing the progress over the course of time of the number of actual curated annotations of proteins in Swiss growth. And so you see this has gone up to about 500,000 uh, current. This is the number of protein sequences that exist in sequence databases. Um, and so this is up to 90 million. So we are nowhere near having good annotations for most of protein space. And that means we need computational approaches for doing this. Uh, and just to give a, a very uh, contained example in the bacterial context of why we need this, if you look at the null mutations that made fitness differences in that data I was showing earlier, about 10% of these significant null mutations are unannotated proteins. And in some cases, you have unannotated proteins that in 10 or 20 different conditions will do something. And this is an E. coli. The situation is much worse for most bacteria about how much we don't know. Now, the usual way to annotate uh, poorly annotated proteins is just to use sequence homology. So you can blast a protein or something like that, find the closest hit, and say, OK, it probably does something like that. Well, it turns out if you actually look at how well this performs, this does pretty well down to about 60% identity between the um, protein that you're trying to annotate and uh, the nearest hit. Um, but if you plot uh, a histogram of the sequence identity to the nearest annotated protein for just randomly drawn members of that protein sequence space, it peaks way below 60% identity. This is actually what the protein annotation folks call the midnight zone, where you cannot do a good job with sequence homology. So we have to have a better way to figure out what all this is doing, because this is all the proteins in pathogens and biotechnologically interesting uh, bacteria, where we need to know what they are, and we can't current methods. So working with um, Yang Chen's lab in Michigan, uh, we've developed a pipeline for doing this kind of annotation using a hybrid of sequence and structure-based approaches. And so what we do, uh, with a given protein sequence we're interested in is, we first all do queries based on sequence and based on annotated protein-protein interactions, and this is all pretty standard. But then we also predict the structure of that protein um, using Yang's uh, program, iPacer. And then we do structural homology searches against everything in the PDB and try to find similar structures and what ligands they bind and things like that. Um, and the reason that we expect this to work is we expect that structure is going to be conserved over longer evolutionary distance than sequence is. So we should be able to do something in that midnight zone with proteins where we don't have any good sequence homologs. I'm going to skip a little bit of the detail in the interest of time and just go to how this performs. So I'm going to show a series of performance plots now. Um, and so what we're doing, this is an experiment where we take 1,200 E. coli proteins where we actually do know what they do. And then we try to annotate them using different cutoffs as you go right to left on the highest sequence identity of things we're allowed to use to try and annotate them. So the problem gets harder and harder as you go from right to left. On the y-axis, it's just a commonly used performance metric for uh, annotation. Uh, and so what I'm showing now is yellow and cyan are using blast or side blast, which are very frequently used. And you can see they uh, decay in performance as you go down to lower available sequence identities. By the time you get down to 30%, they're worse than noise. So if you uh, it show instead the best performing, um, or one of the best performing sequence-based methods from CAPA2, the best performing one, the code was available, available for, this was called GoFDR, you see the same general pattern, although it does a bit better, in terms of this decay as you go to lower sequence identities. But if you bring in just the structure-based component of our hybrid pipeline, you see something interesting. It doesn't do quite as well as, say, GoFDR on easy targets but it is very robust 
to decreasing sequence identity to annotated targets. And so it means it keeps almost the same performance even down into that midnight zone of 20 to 30% identity. And then you can add in the other two components of our pipeline and actually get the full cofactor hybrid model. And this is combining the best of both worlds. We get really great performance when there's high sequence identity, but it's able to maintain um, much better performance even at uh, lower identities. And this is the case for all three aspects of Go terms. Um, so this seems to do very well. But the other very nice thing about incorporating structure into these predictions is normally, if um, people are doing sequence-based annotations, the only output you get at the end of the day is a set of Go terms or something like that to tell you roughly maybe what functions these things have. When we can do structure predictions, we get things like the combining sites. We can see where things are relative to each other. And that turns out to be much more informative to, for doing the follow-up experiments to actually be sure about what's going on. Um, so I'm going to skip through this a little bit, but there is a server up um, that can do these uh, calculations if anyone's interested. But I just want to show a couple of examples of how um, we've been able to make use of these. So this is maybe the easiest case. This is a gene in E. coli called YAIP. Uh, if you do sequence-based annotations, it comes out as a predicted proposal transferase. But if you do the structure <coughs> predictions, you get the same annotations, and you get predicted glucose binding sites, three of them over here. There's a predicted UDP binding site over here. And so you can read the entire story of this enzyme off of the predictions you get from this. That this is probably using UDP glucose as a substrate. It's going to be polymerizing, and there's a nice little exit channel uh, coming out over here. And sure enough, if we purify this thing, it will polymerize UDP glucose. It's synthesizing cellulose with that. And if we mutate this residue, all of the activity goes away. Um, now, we can also uh, use this to figure out uh, what targets are doing, or really there's no other basis for understanding what's going on. All right, so since I have very little time left, I want to give the quickest possible answer to my other two questions, which are uh, when are different genes expressed and how do cells uh, make those decisions? Um, and so the way we're trying to address this, um, there are a couple approaches that one could use to try and address those questions. The problem is they either don't give you all the information you want or they're completely impractical, little problems. Um, so you can do RNA-seq to look at what genes are being expressed at any given time, but that doesn't tell you the why, which is a big part of what we're interested in. Um, you can use ChIP-seq to uh, profile where on the bacterial chromosome a given protein is binding under any condition, but E. coli has about 300 transcription factors. We don't know what half of them do, uh, which is part of that first problem. Um, and so that would mean 300 chip seek experiments uh, for each condition that you're interested in, which is really just not feasible. Uh, so what we are doing instead um, is using a method called um, iPod HR. Uh, it is, my postdoc advisor really insisted on the name. It's really a pain to type on the Mac because it autocorrects the capitalization to be what Apple thinks it should be. Um, but what this gives us is a one-dimensional protein occupancy profile under any given condition of where proteins are bound to the chromosomes. So the way this works, we cross-link proteins to DNA in vivo under the condition we care about. Then we throw this into a phenol chloroform extraction, and the protein DNA complex is partitioned to an interface layer that we've been able to wash really well. And then if we purify and sequence the DNA from that interface and compare it to an input sample, we can see where the occupancy is. Um, so what we can get out of this, um, the simplest thing is just we can see that when we already know there's a transcription factor binding site, we recover the right answer. So here, for example, is a binding site for the pure interpressor, pure R. We know it should be occupied in rich media, but not in minimal media. And that's exactly what we see from our experiments, where you get a nice occupancy signal sitting right on top of that binding site in rich media when there are purines present. It goes away in minimal media. It also goes away if you delete pure R. But what's really great about this uh, is we didn't have to decide ahead of time we were looking for pure R. And we didn't have to decide ahead of time that we were looking at this particular region of the chromosome. Um, but instead, uh, we got data on the entire chromosome, on all the proteins that we're able to detect. And that lets us find things like this. Um, this is the regulatory region upstream of a gene called SDAC. Um, and we can see uh, SDAC is 25-fold lower expressed in minimal media than it is in rich media. Thank you. Um, 
But there are no annotated transcription factor binding sites upstream of this. Uh, but from our protein occupancy signals, we can see what sure looks like an activator binding site upstream of this. And so then we're able to make biotinylated fates of DNA that correspond to that sequence, pull out what binds to it, and identify an unannotated transcription factor called YIP that seems to be what's binding to that site. And then sure enough, we can do gel shifts and show a specific interaction between uh, YIP and the SDAC promoter. So this combined with the functional annotation uh, becomes a really great toolbox for rapidly figuring out uh, in any bacteria, because you need almost no information to go in uh, besides a genome sequence, what all the proteins are doing and when and why they're getting expressed. And so because of time being basically out, I'm going to skip over all the fun stuff we have with chromosome confirmation. Yeah, I have too many slides. Um, and uh, but I'm happy to talk about it later if anyone's interested. So there's, there's some fun large-scale structure also that we're starting to see. Um, just acknowledge uh, all the members of my group uh, who have contributed to the data that I was showing and looking rapidly through. Um, but most importantly, just thank Klaus for building this uh, really wonderful research family. It's really uh, great to uh, have everyone out here for this. And thank you for your time. One minute left. Honestly, you kept me on time. Yeah, okay. for a question. Anybody? Oh, all right. So, uh, is this goal term uh, pipeline like public? Yes, it is. So, there's um, a paper in nucleic acids research earlier this year um, that describes it, and there's a web server. So, you can just take your own structures, which can either be crystal structures or predicted structures, and plug them right in there. So um, if you search for the paper, which is just uh, something by me and if I guess research earlier this year, you can find the link. Okay. So, uh, let's thank you one more time. So even though I'm part of the old guard in many ways, I'm still the newest lab in town. Yeah. It's a pleasure, particularly to, to, to have been here, to come here with uh, uh, two members of my group, uh, Dr. Itoguchi, postdoc, and Mrs. Petrov, graduate students, who are the two new members of the family here. So <laughs> that is always nice. And indeed, I, am go I was going to talk about things that are really interesting. An ambitious computational drug discovery from proteome to drugs, but I changed my mind. I'm just going to talk about conformational selection and docking because I would never have time otherwise to, to talk about everything. If you allow me a shameless sales speech for five seconds, then uh, I am the Paling Chen Chair and now professor of biophysics in the Department of Biological Sciences. There is a search starting last week for the sensing Paling Chan Chair and Professor of Biophysics in the Physics Department. So just saying, okay? <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. Actually, you did. I'm in the search committee. So. <laughs> All right. It was 20 years ago today, almost to the day, that Klaus Schulten told the band to play. If you like the Beatles, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't like the Beatles, pardon this very obscure and cryptic slide. But indeed, it was almost 20 years ago, it will be 20 years ago in a few weeks that I came here, uh, January 1998, actually, um, and joined the group. I first met close in 1996 um, in Zikon Yaakov, Israel. I was finishing, I was, I was in 
trying to finish my PhD, starting to finish my PhD, I uh, was working on uh, free energy calculations of uh, retinoid isomerization in bacterial rhodopsin with Jeremy Smith and Benoit. Well. And uh, I went to the um, retinal protein conference in Israel, and I know Klaus would be there, of course, Klaus was uh, uh, the modeling guy in bacterial rhodopsin, so I was very anxious to meet who is him, and I was very nervous, you know, and oh, I'm going to talk to Klaus Schulten, because we, we, of course, knew very well uh, all, all the work of the group. And uh, I finally got, uh, got to him, and I was presenting a poster, and I told him, Professor Schulten, uh, I'm working on uh, retinal isomerization in dark adaptive states. I have a poster. Please come. I'm doing this and then that. And Klaus kind of stopped me and say, I really want to go and see your poster, but I want you to know that I'm also working on those very same things. And I did not realize, it took me many years to realize how amazing it was that Klaus Schulten was a B. Uh, uh, protein, uh, bacterial rhodopsin, uh, retinal protein modeling guy, was taking his time to want me an obscure graduate student, that whatever I could say would be held against me in a court of law, essentially, you know? <laughs> and it's rare. I have never, I mean, it took me many years to understand the level of, of, of respect for the graduate student uh, and of ethics in his work and in his way to interact with people. But you know, always remember that, even though, again, it was not clear at first, and always remember how very careful Closen was, or very respectfully was, not only of individuals as individuals, but of their ideas, of their work, of their welfare, you know. And indeed, he was working with a uh, with one of the two, Ilya, that you mentioned, he was working with, I don't know which one, if it was the one who tried to kill him or the, the other one. He scooped us, of course, he published a pretty good paper, actually. I don't know who that Ilya was, but he did a fairly good job publishing in JAX. Uh, he scooped us, of course, but he remembered me, and when I applied to this group, he said, okay, come on, join me. So that was 1998, a few weeks before, after I joined. Uh, you recognize a bunch of people, and I was here yesterday. We have a short hair David there, and uh, uh, two important people are missing from this picture. Then, you, because I can't remember the details, but there was something wrong, at NC, something between NCSA and, and uh, uh, the Molinas uh, Supergroup, uh, and, and so you were called to say the day again, basically. And so I don't know exactly what, what I remember, but they called the cavalry, and that was you to make sure everything was moving forward. So you were at CLSL. That was a, uh, a group um, <laughs> retreat somewhere out of town. And uh, the other person that um, uh, is missing is Imad, because, for a good reason, he was not yet part of the group, you know. <laughs> and here's something I think I told you, but I don't think I told you all the details, so here I go now. Um, okay, Ferenc Molnar, you remember Ferenc, of course, my uh, friend and I were working on back here in and uh, Klaus came to us one day and said, uh, there is this guy from the group of Sendor, Sendor Sulai, I don't bear there, right? Uh, who is going to come, he's very interested in bacterial rhodopsin, he would like to work with us. And, and Klaus said the following, and I don't think I spilled the beans, but you know, this guy looks really good. He could be useful for something. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> he turned out he was useful for some things, you know. <laughs> and uh, so Klaus asked me to go and pick you up at the airport, and so I did, and uh, therefore I can say that very literally, I'm the guy who brought Imad here. We're not talking to you that we are going for something else. I almost didn't make it to this picture because uh, we arrived in the US. My wife was eight months pregnant. We were really crazy. We were not 20, obviously, and we would never do that ever again, but we did back then. And uh, so I, that was the first day of the uh, group uh, retreat, and then I got a phone call that my wife was on the way to the hospital. So uh, Gila uh, brought me and. Uh, and, um, and uh, <laughs> So it was one of the many uh, uh, shoot and lab babies that were born there, actually. So, uh, which was really cool, actually. Something good about that. We, we, I realized, and we talked with Ferenc uh, about that, uh, that a lot of us, it was a very important time for all of us. You know, we were becoming professional scientists, 
and we were becoming parents for many of us. Uh, and sometimes, like uh, Peter, you mentioned something. Also, my dad passed away when I was a postdoc, and uh, and so those were very important years, professionally and personally. We were becoming parents. We were losing our family, and and close and Zen were always with us for the good and not so good times, and always, always supporting us. Which again, I realize now. And I don't think anyone really realized how important it was for us all to have you guys here. So, um, Dr. Mutter, Dr. Mutter and uh, you, you have a very, very extended family. Another good thing about having a baby, I'm not giving you any suggestions, but <laughs> another good thing about having a baby when you were in that, uh, in that and close as lab. Is that close would give you a bit of a break. And I remember he came to me and said, Jerome, you're going to write the NSF proposal for the renewal, uh, renewal of the uh, P450, uh, oh, sorry, of the uh, bacteriorhodopsin um, uh, grant. And so I expect you to be here a lot in the next three weeks, so we all know what it means, okay? And he went, and he came back five minutes after and said, well, I know you have a baby, so you can text Thursday evening off to do your laundry. Since these days, I kid you not, Thursday evening is my laundry day. <laughs> All right. So, back then I started working with you, Eva, as well, as, and, and Ferenc, on what was, back then, one of the three largest uh, models and systems in the entire group. We built a uh, thermal membrane model, so a trimer of bacterial dosing in its natural uh, 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 enzyme, uh, sorry, lipid environment. <laughs> we published that pretty well, the feature article together. We got the cover of JP Scambi, and that's me claiming my one title of glory here on the third floor and pointing at this one, uh, at this one cover. Uh, the uh, National Academy of Science, 10 years later almost, picked it picked it uh, as an example of what's cool out there, you know, so hey, that bad, that bad. Another very important uh, uh, influence besides bringing in that is that we needed an hexagonal uni uh, symmetry operation, hexagonal symmetry operations to build this uh, purple membrane model, and it was not yet in NAMD2, all right? So in that for instance, I tried to make Jim's life impossible for a long time without much success, and Close was away in a, in a meeting. And um, when Close came back, he asked me, So, what about the hexagonal unit cell? And I said, Well, yeah, it's not going very, very, very fast. I thought my head was going to be chopped off. But he, uh, fortunately, sorry, Jim, but fortunately, he walked to you and talked to you because everything was depending on you, of course. And he came back and said, It's going to help. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, I see everyone using. You know, uh, hexagonal symmetry in your beautiful, beautiful systems, uh, viral systems that you're all using. So that's me. Okay. <laughs> there were three mo two models larger than ours. <laughs> Imagine 100,000 atoms of big blood river. And we, this paper, feature article, was a full one nanosecond and this simulation. Huh? <laughs> and um, yep, so one system was larger, it was a photosystem. And there was an even larger system which we called the virus. And no one really knew what virus it was. But close for years had this virus capsid assembled. And he really wanted really hard to simulate the dynamics. And everyone was horrified at that because every two or three months he would say, We really need to animate this model. We have a site visit, we need to show the pushing the envelope. And so one poor soul was, was, was sentenced uh, by close to uh, simulate the bloody virus. And everyone was short of computing time. So each time close was bringing up the virus in, 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 in those famous Monday group meetings. Everyone, it was, we all were very respectful and everyone would say yes to whatever Close wanted to do, of course, except for the virus, where it was a long wine and plain and agitation for revolution. So, of <laughs> my generation, the last few years of the 20th century, I'm afraid we were just but a long frustration for Close because no one wanted to touch the virus, the virus, you know. <laughs> 
And then I see all those wonderful virus simulations that are running these days. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that your genera the generation of the first decade of the 21st century finally uh, managed to achieve a, a one of closest dreams that we all managed to somehow miraculously resist from doing. <laughs> Good job. All right, so uh, let me talk about what I've been doing since. Um, uh, I have to disclose that I'm involved with uh, private drug discovery companies in which I have uh, ownership or executive positions or uh, equity or, and, uh, and or that I am uh, a consultant for, but I will not talk about anything directly related to those work except for one slide, which is coming from a published paper, so nothing secret will happen here. I like it so much, I'm going back, apparently. And uh, like uh, twice we have seen already, I'm going to follow Klaus's opinion and start with the conclusions, okay? So what I will be talking about is that we, uh, our work to merge together massive docking with molecular dynamics using supercomputers to show that protein sample conformations and sometimes rarely, rarely sample conformations that will be very actively selected by the ligands, that docking is significantly improved in terms of its performance from this molecular dynamic sampling of proteins accessible to formational space, and that using this approach, which uh, 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 Imad and Romy have talked about uh, briefly, using this approach, uh, we, uh, we have been able to discover new drug candidates as well as we're currently working on a technology platform that will allow us to uh, predict uh, toxicity and potency issues of clinical trials on the road. A bit of semantic first, what is a drug? There are two kinds of drugs, so to speak. About two-thirds of known drugs are small molecules that will bind to a protein, and they will fix somehow what the protein is doing wrong in a disease, right? So you fix a non-functioning protein thingy. Either it's working too much and you want to slow it down, or it's working not at all and you want to reactivate it, but you basically send a small molecule. That's what traditional pharma is about. It's essentially a chemical-based industry. Medicinal chemists are calling the shots there, okay? One third but growing of known drugs are uh, large molecules, uh, biologics, like uh, antibodies, for instance, or vaccines, that actually perform the biological function themselves. So you're not trying to fix something that's broken, you just bring a new engine, in a way, okay? This is something new. I just got a narrow one on working that on, on the latter, so I'm obviously going to work on that, but most of what we've been doing and all of what I'm going to talk about today is based on small molecules that bind to proteins. Drug discovery, uh, as you know, and it has been said several times, uh, and uh, Chris uh, has talked about all the difficulties that go in this game. Drug discovery is a very long and very expensive process, at least 10 years, more often than not, it's going on the 15 years these days and at least one billion, with a B, as in pottery, one billion dollars, and more often than not, a one and a half, sometimes even two. It's a very long process. In terms of small molecules, as you know, it's a very competitive uh, process that starts with thousands of molecules that are interesting in the lab, and as your process goes down the pipeline from drug discovery to clinical trial to uh, actually be on, on the market, the number of molecules that uh, survive this pipeline, the number goes dramatically down. Okay? And we will talk about that, what we can do to help here. But essentially, drug discovery is about identifying a small molecule that will bind to a specific protein target. It has to bind to its one true love target, but it also has to be potent and not toxic, which is something that is often um, uh, quantified at the very end of the process. Okay. Why does it why do we have to wait until clinical trials to find why proteins are, why, sorry, why drug candidates are potent and, and, and non-toxic? Why do drug candidates fail late and fail expensive? Drug candidates fail for the same reasons they succeed in the first place, because they bind proteins. 
In the lab, um, you can be interested in uh, binding to, say, looks like a metro map from hell, but it's actually, of course, a biochemical pathway, you know. In the lab, your uh, drug they can bind to the one protein you want to target. You're very happy, it does great, you have all kind of uh, in vitro, and sometimes even cell-based assays that really work uh, well and make you very happy. But when you go and try this uh, assay, this drug candidate in much more complex systems, you will find that your uh, drug candidate will be very happy to bind to other proteins. And two things can happen then. Your drug candidate can bind to a lot of other proteins, so it's a promiscuous drug candidate, then gets diluted in a way, and it doesn't do better than placebo. When you read that something doesn't do better than placebo, it doesn't mean it's not doing anything at all. It still is a drug molecule, drug candidate, I should say, that is extremely well in the test tube or in the lab, but uh, the problem is that it doesn't only love your one interesting target, it pretty much loves everyone. So it will bind everywhere. And you cannot just inject five kilograms of the drug in a patient, so okay. <laughs> the other problem that can happen is that your drug candidate that was doing very well against this one target could also bind very well to a small number of targets, okay? Other targets you did not predict at first. And so then it will become toxic, which is very bad news, especially for the patient, but also for your eight or nine years and nine hundred million dollars that you have invested, and uh, that you find that um, your molecule will not be uh, specific enough. All right. And what we are trying to do is do both. I'm mostly going to talk today about the initial part, the discovery part, how we can use what we do, molecular modeling. To come with new interesting drug candidates. But we are actively working on extending this docking, those, those approaches I'm going to talk about to predict also whether or not it may bind to other proteins we absolutely don't want to touch, okay? The motto of the drug uh, um, industry is rather depressing. It's fail early, fail cheap, which is one trouble away from just staying in bed in the morning because, you know, who cares? But um, the, that's exactly the goal, because you fail so late in clinical trials, and so after having spent such a huge amount of money, that even if we improve the process by 10%, it still is a year or two and 100 to 200 million dollars. So that's the kind of numbers that make me not want to stay in bed in the morning. <laughs> so how do we do it? We use ducky, which is something you have seen and heard a million times. Uh, that's the number one approach to structure-based rational drug discovery these days. Virtual high school put screening. We take a protein model, we take libraries of small molecules, and we use computers in my case, supercomputers, to see what molecules are more or less likely to bind to my protein target. And for each of those molecules, each of them, the hundreds of thousands, up to millions, we calculate, we estimate, I should say, a binding free energy in the protein active site, and then we identify the fraction of the original database that we think is going to contain most of the molecules that will end up binding to the protein. So the goal is not to find the needle of the, in the haystack. The goal is to reduce the haystack computationally so much that it becomes possible for your collaborators to find the needle in there. So you start with 100,000 compounds. It costs between 10 and $20 experimentally to screen one compound when everything is said and done. So if you start with a library of 100,000 molecules, no one's going to do you <coughs> one or two million bucks just to go on the fishing expedition. It's certainly not the NIH, you know. Uh, however, if you reduce this 100,000 count on the database to 500 or 1,000, it's going to be possible to find a grant or two to do this, you know. So that's, that's where the value we bring is. In addition, when we are right, we can often identify a mechanism of action. So we can go back on our calculation and say, all right, you confirm that this guy and this guy and this guy that I predicted were going to be in my pool bind well, so let me go back and see how they bind and we can help with the QSAR for next steps, okay? Mm -hmm. It takes one or two minutes per chemical, so that's fine if you're doing 100 or 200 compounds or a couple of thousands. Um, it's not fine at all if you have millions of molecules. 
And that's what I want to do essentially because I'm interested in many protein targets and also the protein targets that microcandidates could bind to eventually down the road. I have to do a lot of docking calculations. And what I'm going to talk about now was uh, 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 following. I done following Close's advice, which uh, was essentially was telling us that all the time, and I've heard it again and again here. If you need a tool that does not exist, make it. And if you don't know how to make this tool, stop complaining and learn to make it. You know. So in other words, take care of your own success. Okay. Uh, no one is going to do it for you. And, um, and and that's kind of situation I, I I found myself in. So when I went to a bridge. We didn't have titans, and five minutes, good grief. Invite me six times in a row, please, Sam, okay? We didn't have a lot of computer. We, we, we had computers, but uh, uh, they were not extremely, I mean, they were extremely powerful, but the docking process of, uh, sucks on them. This is what we obtained on Kraken, which back then was the world of the three supercomputer, University of Tennessee. Um, uh, we, very naively, I saw them just run docking on crack and get a patent <coughs> for months and a paper, and then I will sleep my way to getting tenure in no time. Turns out, though, uh, if you use a supercomputer and you, you, you try to perform docking on an increasing number of cores, you very quickly see that you plateau your performance. Ideally, you would scale, especially since it's an embarrassingly parallel process, you should scale perfectly well. The reality is that. Uh, you start to plateau at around 100 cores-ish. You can use trick and prove that to a couple of hundred cores, but essentially it failed. And, and, and Kraken had 87,000 cores back then. So to make a long story short, we had, I spent the first five years of my tenure track life developing uh, parallelization uh, approaches to docking, all right, and five years later, we were able to screen to, to scale on almost the entire cracking machine. We could have closed this gap. We're not going to bother for a reason I was going to tell you, all right. But essentially, it was MPIizing I/O. We thread for the calculations themselves, but not too well. It was really uh, uh, using MPI to uh, regulate the traffic jam of data in there. All right. And uh, so my students made that. One does not simply use <laughs> it right now because of a petaflop supercomputer, so which is very true. You just don't. And I have a new appreciation for Sanjay, David, uh, John, uh, Jim, of course, when I now that I have not only been a user of what you guys are developing, but I have tried to uh, succeed to an extent in doing it myself. Believe me, I understand more how, 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 how. Heroic, you guys are okay, um, and that was done by Sally Roland Barbara. Sally is now a professor at Kentucky. Roland is at Intel. Barbara is at IBM, and we can screen hundreds of thousands of compounds. We can perform a world of about 10 million compounds, 10 million docking calculations, I should say, in a day on on Titan, if we have the entire Titan, which will always, never will, of course, sorry. Uh, to give you an idea, so that's one protein, 10 million compounds in a day. We can shuttle cores of 10, which was not trivial at first. We were so terrible in scaling. We could use today 100 protein and screen uh, a few hundred of thousand compounds in a day. On a 100 core cluster, it would take us 10 years. When I was in the pharmaceutical industry, in the uh, early 2000s, I had eight cores, and I was part of the uh, uh, computational chemistry department. In fact, I was the computational <laughs> chemistry department. <laughs> I had eight cores, so the, the, it was a very tech-heavy startup. So back then, um, what I can do now in one day on Titan would have taken me about 100 years in the pharmaceutical industry, whose money depends on doing these kind of things. All right, our approach is not to use only one target, but to simulate the dynamic of the target, because we want not to just do the usual induced fit, but actually mimic the conformational selection mechanism, where the protein is in equilibrium between different conformations. One of these conformations is going to be selected by the ligands. This is shown here. So uh, uh, Romy and uh, Ima, you have shown similar things. Let me take a minute just to show that uh, this is a SARC kinase. There is a co-crystalline ligand here, and I'm showing the surface of two other parts of the protein. 
Oh, as we have seen, and Romeo has written that very well, sometimes you have a, a change of the dividing side geometry. Sometimes you have a non-existing side that will eventually open and stay stable, stable. Sometimes you have non-existing side that will open very transiently. You've seen it here? Yes. Seen it? Up, you see a, a bit of, you recognize the software, of course, but you see a bit of the backbone. So, existing binding site in crystal structures change their shape. Non seen binding site in crystal structure can open and be very stable or can open very transiently. And so, at the end of the day, we take a bunch of binding site geometries, a bunch of potential dry candidates, and we systematically and combinatorially try docking, traditional docking against the one crystal structure will be that, but we also try every uh, possible confirmation we can put, put our found hands on. We have been very successful in applying this approach after we finally got it to work against a variety of targets. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the details, but in every single case, we have been able to identify molecules that were performing the, design, uh, the desired uh, biological action. I'm not going to talk about what you have done, Karen, but it's really, I sound like a beloved president, but it's great. <laughs> it works. <laughs> uh, one thing about Karen, and that makes me very happy, not only you were very successful in finding 10 molecules, eight of them could not have been predicted, and we used only the crystal structure of your target. But you're also the newest member of the group here, and you recently, a few days ago, joined an EMATS group. And so it's, I'm particularly proud of that, of course, a way to uh, close in the loop. And not only that, but this is... Hmm? And your talk. And my talk, exactly. <laughs> Clever, then. <laughs> not only that, but uh, this is uh, two days ago, Karen and I, in room 3115, which was at the very same spot and the very same desk where I was 20 years ago. That's a guy who was born during the group retreat, okay? <laughs> to, to do my all my free Thursday evening. <laughs> and so poker and you thought you were done with me, but now there you go again, come on, come on to yeah. <laughs> uh, Everything works absolutely great, and I'm not going to talk about these fantastic things, except for this one, with your permission, that slide, that show that uh, if we look at the top 0.5 or 1 or 5 or 10 percent of the database um, after we screen it, if we're using a random selection or a crystal structure, we only find a small number of what we know, what we eventually verify to be a uh, real hits when we use this approach where we use as uh, at, uh, we use a. Uh, Ensemble snapshots, we essentially find them all very quickly. Okay? And that was a meat of my talk, but I'm not going to talk about it. And interestingly, some of the most efficient snapshots are sampled extremely rarely in the trajectory. That's very interesting. It means we have to put in the investments to calculate those very rarely sampled conformations, which often are responsible for most of what this protein can bind. I'm going to go through a really set of really cool slides to finish with the most important two slides of um, maybe my career, as a, as a matter of fact. Um, first of those two slides is, of course, like everyone else, I owe everything uh, uh, to close those, and then those two years, uh, and then, of course, much more than hired me back uh, after uh, I, I escaped from the pharmaceutical <coughs> industry. Uh, but as opposed to those two years I spent here, my kids were born, my father passed away, I became a, a scientist, thanks to Klaus and Zen. And of course, like everybody else, I am now. Uh, um, I, um, I can only say thank you, Klaus, and uh, I want to express, of course, my admiration and my gratitude. But I think it's very important for me to say that uh, I'm looking forward and I also want to express my admiration and gratitude to for all of you guys, uh, Zen, Chrissy, Madalek, Sanjay, and everyone, uh, Jim, uh, Dave, uh, John, and uh, um, everyone here in the group. Um, uh, we will, um, the group continues, of course. Uh, Chris said it very well in his analogy at uh, Closest Funerals. He's not gone, really. He continues to live through our work and uh, through your work, essentially. 
And I, uh, I know for, uh, we'll, I will continue to uh, look up to you guys uh, to show the path forward in our field, okay? So uh, I, I thank you very much for that. I'm very, very grateful to you for that. I will continue to look up for you. To look, to look up to you for my, my work because it advances my career, it advances my science, of course, and at the end of the day, because I think uh, we're all family. So, thank you. Thank you very much. As a true student of clothes, I took too much time of course. It could have been worse. There was enough there that someone asked a question of it, or made a comment. Oh, all right. Am I? So, how short is too short term for this talking? Well, let's say, I, um, the shortest one we have found in this particular example was not that short, because we run a one microsecond simulation. It's a GPCR in full memory environment. So one person of a microsecond is 10 nanoseconds, exactly. So it's not very, very, very short. Um, and Romy Amaro, who by the way started when she was a postdoc at, uh, in Andy's lab, she published two very seminal important papers in 2008. Back then they were running a five nanosecond trajectory from which they already could see some improvement in talking results. So way small, shorter than what we've read here, but it was already interesting. So the shortest one is five times a second. I suppose we'll find shorter ones. I mean, it's too short, then doesn't Absolutely, that's a very important point. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a balance between the life uh, time of the conformation and the binding free energy. If you never sample the best possible binding geometry, you're just not gonna bind the bloody thing, absolutely. Which is something we are really working on, on our system approach, machine learning, I right there, I said it, uh, approach to try to build interactomes, all the molecules that could bind with all the proteins. So I think there were two more questions from Bob, and I think you were first. Oh, okay. So, um, I, very interesting talk. And I was wondering, like, you know, all the standard way of finding fine topics like this space, of docking, etc. And how different is this from the simulation result as like um a standard way? As we know that like even like we get a thousand active compounds, the dots like this, and there's no uniform answer as to finding topic structure to those <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. You mean there is no so there's no uniform, like there's no uh, fixed structure that can bind some of these active compounds. Oh, true, true. We we find it. That's a very good point. We. It's not that there is one structure, and certainly not the crystal structure, with our many structures. In one of the slides I didn't show, you could see very clearly that um, about, about three to five percent of the structures end up being selected significant, statistically significantly by ligands. So it means you throwing away, so to speak, 95% of the structures, but there are 5% of the structures that are sampled and sometimes rarely, that will be uh, very important. So on 5,000, we need 55 million, actually 200 million docking calculations. So 5% uh, uh, of 5,000 is, whoa, 500. So let's say 500. So out of 5,000 snapshots we re recorded from the trajectory, about 500 were selected by ligands. And sometimes there is a lot of, 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 of common ligands, you know, so but very significantly selected by ligands. So yes, it's clearly more than just one structure. And there's a bunch of them, but most of the structures sampled by the protein are not selected by ligands at all. Okay, many drugs uh, target memory proteins. Uh, can you deal with that? Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, as you also have seen very clearly in one of the slides, <laughs> you cannot pass that, it's horrible. But I have a slide for that. Uh, uh, it, one of the slides I didn't show was showing that. Uh, about half of the uh, successful cases I was showing are involved membrane protein. About half of the drugs that we know target membrane proteins, 
and about 75% of adverse effects that are responsible for failures at the clinical trial are due to membrane protein. So another wonderful slide that I didn't show was, was re-emphasizing the role of modeling and understanding what happens in membranes. That's why you guys are so important because you're pushing the envelope on what we can do with, with membrane proteins, describing their structure, describing their dynamics in more and more realistic environment. Absolutely, dealing with membrane protein is the sine qua non condition for building successful drug discovery pipeline, absolutely. All right, on that one. Thank you. I think on the schedule, it says that there's supposed to be some words of wisdom wrapping this up from the organizing committee. So, uh, hi, organizing committee. Hello to your left. If you have a few words that you'd like to say, uh, maybe before. And, you know, for me personally, this has been a very moving uh, memorial. I also have to say this is the third one I've attended, uh, starting with Martin Carpus's presentation for the physics department, and then uh, Helmut and Emma Gow and Jenny Rubner organized one in Munich. So I also want to tell you that the family of Klaus ex students, co workers that are sitting over in Europe. And um, I think you know some of them, but I hope you have a chance to meet more of them. Because many of the same statements that you made here, I saw voiced and expressed over in, in Germany. So, you know, please take all the good lessons from Klaus. He wasn't quite the angel that you all <laughs> But, you know. <laughs> But you can certainly be proud, and I think Elizabeth said it well. You know, we don't have class now, and I really do myself miss his advice, and be good to one another and help each other. Well, I mean, I, uh, I have a couple of thank you, I mean, first and foremost again, to Beckman for the uh, generous actually responsibility for the whole event including the financial aspect they actually initiated this, and especially Annie, because we also thanked them and her team, that it was impossible actually without them. Doing this also, we thank the TCPG group, the current group members, they did wonderful work hosting the uh, guests and, you know, transportation, video setup and everything. Thank you guys for being show. And I think I, should, I would like to thank everybody else actually for work. Most importantly, actually, who just came and made this really uh, what I consider a wonderful meeting. I'm so impressed by the breadth of the talks, the reading of science, at the same time, personal and professional kind of experiences that you all had. Extended family of clouds. We had no cousins and no children and grandchildren. And the experience you had with him as a colleague, as a collaborator, as a mentor, as a friend, as a person. So this was really wonderful. I think it was really young, but I was hoping for actually. So this was, and of course, being having flowers in the middle of all this was essential for us. So thank you very much for coming, making this a successful meeting, and exciting meeting. And as you all said, I mean, Klaus continues to be with us. It's gonna live with us with his impact in the science software, how much work he did, and all the extended family that continue to sort of carry on the place. Thank you. That's a better. <laughs> well, I have nothing uh, left to add uh, because all thanks were already uh, saying, except I can thank my colleagues for the organizing. <laughs> I think even after Mark has left the room, uh, we have to acknowledge a really generous gift from NVIDIA. Oh, okay. Uh, Do I need to leave the room? <laughs> uh, it, it was beyond all expectations, okay. and I think it really just reflects what Jensen Wong had told me, that Klaus made him so excited to get GPU computing into biology. He supported that effort, and that included also having one of his vice presidents get the 
company, you know, airplane to come and start teaching the first course here on how to program um, the, the GPUs, and that was done with when they move. So uh, again, such a generous offer. We'll do everything we can to sort of keep on promoting new technology, particularly in the GPU computing region. <coughs> and uh, wish you all a safe trip back home, and just try to keep in touch. Thank you all again.